Tuesday, March 22nd, 2016, Committee of the Whole to Order. Would you please stand and join me for a Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 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 Alderman Sinor. Here. Alderman Turner. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderman Proctor. Here. Alderman Joe. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderman Tylen. Here. Alderman Donnellan. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mr. Chairman, a quorum is present. Okay, I'd accept the motion for the approval of the March 8th committee meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, Madam Treasurer, would you please present the Treasurer's report? Yes, sir. Thank you, Chair Hanauer. For the month of February, we had a beginning balance in the corporate fund of $4,737,560. We took in total receipts of $6,076,430. We had total disbursements of $8,163,228, which left us with an ending balance for the month of February of $2,650,762. This concludes my report, Chair. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay. Uh, are there any questions regarding the OBM contract report? All right, having said none. Um, I know we have a presentation uh, on the poll, but what we're going to do is we're going to move that uh, to when we get to that ordinance. Um, next, we have ordinance tabled or remaining in committee. Mr. Clerk, would you please read those ordinances? 2015, 116-2015-121, 2015-369, 2015-371, 2016-094. 2016-095, 2016 2016-096, 2016-099, 2016-100. Okay, um, I'd take, I will uh, entertain a motion to move 2016 095 and 096 for committee consideration. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, now for ordinances for committee consideration. Mr. Clerk, would you please read the ordinances for public safety? Public safety, 2016-106, an ordinance declaring 10 unclaimed bicycles being held in Springfield Police Department's evidence room to be surplus property and authorizing the Springfield Police Department to donate said bicycles to Spark and Mercy Communities non-for-profit organizations. Move for consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-107, an ordinance authorizing execution of an intergovernmental cooperation agreement with Sangamon County Central Dispatch System, Springfield School District, number 186, and the Spring City of Springfield Police Department. Motion for consent. Second. Second. All, uh, discussion? A discussion, Chairman. Just briefly, does anyone know how many cameras we have in the schools of uh, of District 186? No, Camera with my car. This, look, this is an ordinance that would allow our uh, police department to use the video cameras in the schools. Yeah, they've never disclosed that to us at this point in time until we get all this done. No, we don't really know how many they have. Would you say we probably have one video camera in each school? We don't have any. It's the school district's cameras. Well, I mean, if yeah, we I, have access to the cameras if this goes through. Yeah, if, whatever they have act, whatever they have in their schools, they will give us access to on certain occasions. Have you asked for that information? No, no, we haven't asked for it. Could you ask for that information for our next our council meeting? Sure. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-108, an ordinance authorizing a five-year contract with Taser International for purchase of 165 Axon two-body worn cameras, supporting equipment, and the evidence.com video and storage management system for amount not to exceed $645,618 for the Springfield Police Department. Motion for consent. Second. Second. Question. Um, Chief. 
Could you tell us about the storage part of this, um, how, how we're going to do that, and how the access is going to be for uh, people to, that want to check into that? So you're asking Alderman the question on the storage and then FOIA? Start with the storage. How are we going to do that? Uh, the agreement gives every officer 120 gigabytes of storage annually, and that's like a cellular family plan. You'll have a lot of officers that are going to come nowhere near that and some that will come closer. We found during our pilot program that the average was about 60 gigabytes that we thought would carry, uh, be used in a year, well under what we're providing. And actually the storage is not the biggest cost within the program. That's actually only about $10,000 a year. Worst case scenario you go over is very minute, though in no way do I think we'll go over. So the big, the cost driver is the evidence.com storage and management system. To your other question, when people FOIA what they want for certain incidents that are captured on the body-worn cameras, uh, we will be able to go within the evidence.com system. That's a big driver that makes us feel so confident in this working and that it's so easy to go in there, organize it a certain way by officer, by event, capture only that portion of the video that needs to be released, edit it, and then get that out to the person. So even if it's something that's FOIA multiple times, you would have that one copy on hand and you would just release it as you're required to do so. So are we going to have additional people to handle that kind of stuff? Because, uh, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be labor intensive. It is. Well, we've looked into it. Uh, coordinating with Chicago PD, they're, they're under uh, kind of a body-worn camera, kind of the same place we are, one of their districts. They found that one extra person per 100 people. Now, we currently have a person up there, and we have a spot within our budget uh, where we would like to hire a uh, FOIA records clerk within the records section, but that would be with monies that have currently been budgeted for this. What, what division will that be under? That would be under administrative services, sir. Okay. okay. Is this cloud-based storage? It is cloud-based storage. It's a CGIS criminal justice information systems compliant uh, for security, and it's through the Microsoft Cloud. So Microsoft we're not responsible Azure. for backups or anything like that? That is correct. Okay, good. Mr. Mr. Alderman Donald. Chief, you mentioned uh, FOIA, the FOIA part of it. So the video is treated no differently than, uh, let's say, like uh, dispatch uh, recordings. It's treated the same way where it would be available to anybody that would FOIA it. It would be, and we'd have to make the determination on if it's something that they're authorized to get or if the, the, the video, you said what you're saying, audio, correct? That the audio would need to be redacted because we can also redact audio if that's appropriate. When, when you talked earlier about editing, I assumed you meant cutting, or I'll just say it in my, in my words, cutting out that portion of the video that was FOIA'd, you know, so, or making a copy of it's probably a better way to put it. <coughs> yes, thank when, you for when that you question. Mentioned, when I you mentioned edit. We are not allowed, there's no way we can edit the thank video you. that's in there. What I meant by editing better would have been to kind of clip the right. actual video. We have a five minute video. Only a minute and a half of it is what they want. We can take just that minute and a half. Thank you. That sounds, That's what I meant. Sounds great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Chief. Thank All you. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. That was placed on the debate of consent, oh, Mr. Chair. I believe it was consent. consent. Thank you. 2016 109, an ordinance authorizing a payment to Motorola Solutions Incorporated for monthly Starcom radio services used by the Springfield Police Department Homeland Security in an amount not to exceed $108,120 <coughs> under State Master Contract CSM number 3618850 for the Office of Homeland Security, Bureau of Emergency Communications. Oops, good sign. Second. Any discussion? Uh, discussion, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Madiri, uh, Michael. These questions pertain to both this con uh, ordinance and the following ordinance. Are these uh, renewals of uh, contracts or these new contracts? They're not new contracts. They're actually State of Illinois joint purchase. It's what uh, we access those contracts through the state. And the first ordinance that, you're, that you've got up here right now is just our yearly service fee to Motorola to utilize the radios on the, on the system. So better way to ask the question, are these services that are continuing that we have access to? Yes. And how long back in time do these services go? This particular contract, we went with the Starcom radio, I want to say in 1990 or 2009, mm -hmm. I want to say is when we started with those radios. Okay, and is the annual contract 
amount, the dollar amount changing uh, from this, uh, it, with this uh, agreement as compared to the previous? The only time it changes, Alderman, is if we add or delete. Um, we pay so much per month per unit. So if I have, an, if I have uh, so many officers you know, that are sworn that have the radios, I keep those in service. If we have people retire and we're not going to fill those positions for a while, I actually turn that radio off so that I don't pay the monthly fee. I pay, every, I pay a dollar amount per month per unit. So if I'm not using the radio and they're just sitting on a shelf that we know we're not going to use for four or five months because of the hiring and then the schooling and whatever, I turn them off. So that's the only reason that will fluctuate. Two years ago, the state of Illinois uh, signed a new contract with Motorola for these rates, and they went up, they went up, but now they're set for the next five years. Okay. So we're set there. Thanks for that explanation. Okay. Any further questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. 2016-110, an ordinance authorizing a payment to Verizon Wireless for monthly data services for MDC and video units in an amount not to exceed $135,000 under State Master Contract CSM number 033559P for the Office of Homeland Security and Bureau of Emergency Communications. Most consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Public Works 2016-111, an ordinance authorizing a contract with Azteca Systems Incorporated for the maintenance of City Works <coughs> Order 1 asset management software application for an amount not to exceed $140,000 for a two-year period for the Office of Public Works. Motion for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. 2016-112, an ordinance authorizing execution of an agreement with the State of Illinois Department of Transportation for land acquisition associated with the 11th Street and Richley Avenue crossing project. Section 15-SHSRT3-00-RR and job number C-96-224-15 for the Office of Public Works. Motion for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. 2016-113, an ordinance authorizing execution of agreement number JT-616 and job number C-96-224-15 for the State of Illinois Department of Transportation for jurisdictional transfer of FAU-8031 in North 11th Street and FAU-7969 Ridgeley Avenue for the Office of Public Works. Move to consent. consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 2016-114, a supplemental resolution notifying the State of Illinois Department of Transportation that the motor fuel tax funds in the amount of $385,870 may be used for land acquisition for the 11th Street and Ridgely Streets Great Crossing Reconstruction Project for the Office of Public Works. Good sent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Present. Have it. Mr. Oh, Clerk, please it. note me on any transportation projects with the financial amount to be present, please. Noted. No. 2016-115, an ordinance accepting the lowest bid and authorizing execution of contract number PW16-01-66 with West Construction Company for the 2017 sidewalk program in the amount not to exceed $1,409,744 for the Office of Public Works. Motion, Motion to consent. consent, please. Discussion. Who, who is was construction company? Was construction SNA. They did the work last year. Um, Same company. Yes. You're good. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. 2016-116, an ordinance accepting the lowest bid and authorizing execution of contract number PW16-01-66 with Kinney Contractors Incorporated for the 2017 Residential Sidewalk Program in the amount not to exceed $1,725,785.75 for the Office of Public Works. Motion Move. for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. 2016-117, an ordinance authorizing a supplemental agreement between the City of Springfield and the State of Illinois for land acquisition for the 11th Street Extension Project from Stevenson Drive to Lincolnshire Boulevard, MFT section number 95-00361-04-PV for the Office of Public Works. Motion for consent. consent. Second. You need discussion? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 
2016-118, an ordinance authorizing execution of a professional services agreement with Crawford Murphy and Telly Incorporated for construction engineering for the 11th Street extension from Stevens Drive to Lincolnshire Boulevard, project MFT section number 950361-04-PV for the Office of Public Works. Good, good sense. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I have it. 2016-119, an ordinance authorizing an agreement between the City of Springfield and the State of Illinois for construction of the 11th Street extension from Stevens Drive to Lincolnshire, Bowley and Project MFT section number 95-00361-04-PV, job number C-96-213-96, and project number HHP, HPP 4053004 for the Office of Public Works. Good, good sign. Second. All in favor, or any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Present. Ayes have it. Noted. 2016-120, a resolution notifying the State of Illinois Department of Transportation that motor fuel tax funds in the amount not to exceed, in the amount of $1,598,000 may be used for construction of the 11th Street Extension Project, MFT section number 95-00361-04-PV for the Office of Public Works. Good sense. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Present. 2016-121, an ordinance authorizing a contract between the City of Springfield and Floyd's Imparts for purchase and sale of real estate located at 1026 Adlai Stevenson Drive for an amount not to exceed $290,000 and relocation expenses and closing costs not to exceed $62,000 and for a total amount not to exceed $352,000. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> 2016-122, an ordinance authorizing a contract for sale of real estate with Area 1 LLC, a Delaware Limited Liability Company, for acquisition of a parcel of real estate located at 1032 Adelaide Stevenson Drive at no cost to the city for the 11th Street Extension Project and authorizing a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $80,393.42 for the Office of Public Works. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-138, an ordinance authorizing an agreement between the City of Springfield and the State of Illinois for construction of the 11th Street Beautification Project, Eighth MFD Street. Section 8th Street. 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 Street, Beautification Project, MFT Section Number 10-00471-00-LS, Job Number C-96-205-16, and Project Number TE-00-D6-123 for the Office of Public Works. Move to consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? Quick question. What exactly is being done here? Plant trees. You didn't read all that. Beautification project. Beautification. Thank you. It's a street, streetscape project just to the south of the Lincoln home area. Uh, it's kind of cleaning up some of the curb line, putting in some pavers in some areas. Uh, basically, redesign the area, kind of be similar to the downtown. Sort of a continuation of what's downtown? So, somewhat, yes. And is that property in the TIF district? That it is not in the district. It's not in the TIF district. No. Thank you very much. It's in a historical. It's in a All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016 139, a supplemental resolution notifying the State of Illinois Department of Transportation that motor fuel tax funds in the amount of $98,808 may be used for the 8th Street Beautification Project, MFT, number 10-00471-00-LS for the Office of Public Works. Move for consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Guys have it. Present. Noted. Thank you. 2016-140, an ordinance authorizing purchase of right-of-way and temporary construction easement at the southwest corner of Isles Avenue and Archer Elevator Road, MFT section number 02-00431-00-PV, project number P-96-219-07, and job number C-96-201-16 from Young Men's Christian Association of Springfield for an amount not to exceed $5,000 for the Office of Public Works. Motion for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 
2016-141, an ordinance authorizing purchase of right-of-way at the southeast corner of Isles Avenue and Archer Elevator Road, MFT section number 02-00431-00-PV, project number P-96-219-07, and job number C-96-201-16 from Anthony Zawalski and Donna Zawalski for an amount not to exceed $30,000 for the Office of Public Works. Motion for consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Ayes have it. 2016-142, an, or an ordinance authorizing agreement with the State of Illinois for construction of Archer Elevator Road and Isles Avenue improvements. MFT section number 15-00431-01-PV for the Office of Public Works. Good Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-143, an ordinance authorizing execution of a professional services agreement with Crawford Murphy and Telly Incorporated for construction for the Archer Elevator Road and Isles Avenue improvements, motor fuel tax, section number 15-00431-00-PV for an amount not to exceed $299,289.50 for the Office of Public Works. Good Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-144, a supplemental resolution notifying the State of Illinois Department of Transportation that motor fuel tax funds in the amount of $3,164,289.50 may be used for the Archer Elevator Road and Isles Avenue Improvements Project, MFT section number 15-00431-00-WR for the Office of Public Works. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Present. Noted. Ayes have it. 2016-146, an ordinance approving a four-way stop intersection at Greenbrier and Winston Drives. Move for consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Finance. 2016-145, an ordinance authorizing an additional payment of $32,000 for a total amount not to exceed $182,000 for Livingstone, Mueller, O'Brien, and Davlin, PC, for defense of workers' compensation claims from March 1st, 2015 to February 29th, 2016. Move debate. Debate. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, take 2016-147 for withdrawal. What does that pertain to? There's, this is a duplicate ordinance, and the uh, clerk said that we needed to pull that off. Second the motion. Or motion to withdraw 147. Any discussion? What's, du what's it the duplicate of? Uh, one, is it 130? 131. 131. It's on. It's identical. It's on the there we go. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-149, an ordinance authorizing execution of the 2016 Planning Service Agreement with the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission and authorizing payment in an amount not to exceed $179,550 from January 1st, 2016 through December 31st, 2016. Moved to concern. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. General City Business, 2016-123, an ordinance approving the appointment of Starla R. R. Norris to the Springfield Disabilities Commission. Move to debate. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-124, an ordinance approving the appointment of Deanna Brown to the Community Relations Commission. Move to debate. Second. 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 Any discussion? Yes. Madam Clerk, have all of these candidates been vetted? That's my question. Madam Treasurer. Sorry. I think Frank looks like a girl too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, no, these all these candidates are just fine. I've been uh, there's been several appointments later. There is one coming up in a week or so that I've been in contact with Bonnie Drew about that has not paid a debt, but they're not on tonight's agenda. So you're good for tonight. Question. Mr. All Chair. Mr. Do we require these folks to show up so we can see who we're appointing to the board, or are we just name them and let them start serving? Are any, are any of these folks here tonight that are up for appointment? Ms. Starla Norris and uh, Ms. Deanne Brown. I can have them here if you would like to. 
Well, I think I think since they are serving in the in the public venue, that the public has the right to see their bright shiny faces in front of the committee. And I agree. Um, all in, in the past, a while, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Whose phone was that? All right. All did did we vote on that? No, I'm lost. Did all in favor? All right. All right. Opposed. Ayes have it. 2016-125, an ordinance approving the appointment of Rhiannon Gurley to the Springfield Community Relations Commission. Motion for omnibus vote of 125, 126, 127, 128, and 129 to the debate agenda. Second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, are any of the uh, appointees here tonight? That would be uh, Rhiannon Gurley, Veronica Williams, Blanca Bernasek, Clarice Ford, Harish Bot, are any of the nominees here tonight? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. I'll do it first. Okay, noted. 2016-130, an ordinance to decrease the number of Class E <coughs> liquor licenses by one and increase the number of Class D liquor licenses by one for Miss D's Kitchen Bar and Grill Incorporated, DBA, as Miss D's Kitchen located at 1031 South 11th Street, Springfield, Illinois. Move to consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. 216-131, an ordinance amending Chapter 38, Section 38.35A of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended to decrease the minimum professional services contract amount for which the City Council approval is required. Motion for debate. Second. Any discussion? Yes, please. Um, Tyler. Alderman Redpath is probably the only other alderman who served when we had a lower threshold <clears throat> other than at the time it would have been chief of staff or executive assistant Donnelly. And I do think that the amount that we had at the time, which I think was a $15,000 threshold, yep. was too low. It's, um, there are certain things that, because times have gone on, inflation has happened, costs of things have gone up, that there's some things that happen with city business that we need to just trust that the mayor is able to handle. And we don't need to micromanage everything. However, I do think that we should be we should have an eye on things i personally think that the 25,000 threshold is still a good threshold um i'm i would be fine with bringing down the um all contracts to a $25,000 threshold i think that's a good number however i do understand with some of the newer aldermen that uh, there have been some decisions that were made that you felt flew in the face of uh, what we as a council had kind of said we wanted to do. So I understand that. I really do. I just think that we need to be careful not to try to micromanage too much. Alderman Donnell. Quick question of Corporation Council. The way the ordinance is written, my understanding is that it's only applicable, the $10,000 threshold is only applicable to professional services contracts and not things such as equipment purchases. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Thank you. Alderman Turner. Um, I, I agree with Alderman Tyler. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the mayor should have the authority to uh, run the city and not be micromanaged by um, Alderman. I think that 25,000 is a good number. And when you look at most of the professional services, they are you know, right around that or, or higher. So I don't think that lowering it to 10,000 will really have that much of an impact other than to be a symbolic one where Aldermen are saying that we want to have, we you know we want to be more involved with what's going on. But from a operational standpoint, I really don't think it'll have that much of an impact to lower it to 25000 and I think that uh, we would be doing a disservice to the city if we did that. Right. Alderman Tyler. Um, don't disagree with anything you said. 
however, I do understand. Why is there a however then? There's a however. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that however. There's been at least two professional services that have that I can think of that since we got inaugurated as a, as a group that have kind of gone against the direction that some of the aldermen wanted to go. Uh, most recently, Stantec. And I think that uh, most of us felt that we sent a pretty clear message when we voted down the Stantec ordinance. And the mayor was completely within his rights to go and do the contract that he did. But I would like to say that the follow-up on that is, is that I feel that as an alderman, that if they bring a contract forward to extend it over the $25,000, I'm not going to rubber stamp it. I'll say no. And I think, and I think that that's a, I think that what you what you're saying is reasonable. But I also, um, again, I repeat what I said before that I that. If this ordinance is to let the mayor know that people were unhappy with that particular ordinance that came forward, I think there are be better ways to send that message other than implementing something that's going to have a much uh, more far-reaching implications. Well, and I think the communication has gotten better with this administration than the past one. I think Alderman McMiniman and you and I can all three mm -hmm. easily say that there's more communication out of the Langfelder administration than the Houston. However, there's still not enough. That's it's just my personal. However, I know <laughs> things can always be better. Right. And you know, a perfect example of that is today. I read in the paper about the comment about annexing the state fairgrounds. We didn't get a heads up on that. Luckily, it wasn't something that the press really jumped on and started coming to the alderman asking questions, where we were caught flat-footed, not knowing that the mayor had said something. Was that in the paper today? It was SJR.com. Oh, no, I don't think it was But this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about with these communications. If the mayor had communicated with us about the Stantec ordinance, that he was going to go forward with it, rather than us finding out about it at a, at a different conversation, at a different time, on a different ordinance. Then we probably wouldn't be seeing this ordinance. You have it. The communication needs to be a little bit better. I, I, and I... And I um, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing. And I'm not. I'm not attacking. I'm just right. throwing I'm, I'm, this out. Yeah. And I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that I think that there are better ways to do it rather than to implement something that will have more, much more far-reaching implications. Mayor Langfelder. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I know this is uh, the Stantec ordinance. That's why you're lowering it. But in my opinion, I think uh, the what was done in that situation with the Y block was. Uh, that wasn't right either. They should have came forward with a new ordinance. As I had stated, if you replay the tape or watch it, I asked two weeks prior to that, let's vote it up or down so we can move forward. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. They uh, prolonged it. And then as far as uh, they, re they really gutted the ordinance or the intent of it. And uh, to me, my opinion, I think they should have, the alderman should have came forward with a whole new ordinance. At that point in time, I said my intention was to abide by city code, which I did, and I was going to go forward with the uh, consultant. So uh, for anybody that has surprises, uh, you know, they shouldn't be because that's been discussed on weeks on end. I intended to bring a consultant in within the parameters of the city code, and that's what we did. As far as annexation, be on notice, we're going to annex uh, all the holes in the donuts, at least come forward with those. The state fair shouldn't be a uh, surprise. How that came into being was uh, the governor asked me to attend a news conference. And at that point, one of the reporters asked what I had relayed to the governor or his representatives. And one of that, the important things were two items, so you're not caught off guard. One was the annexation of state fairgrounds. And the reason why that's important is because we have firefighters at a firehouse that's not in the city. And so uh, that would help the city. If you're looking at what's best for the city, is to get additional revenues through the sales tax revenues generated throughout the year at the state fairgrounds. It's been approached at least by two previous mayoral administrations, and it's important that the city move forward in that progression. I think if you surveyed a lot of the city residents, most of them would have thought the fairgrounds was in the city, but it's not. So uh, the other thing I did push forward with is with the, uh, uh, the excavation, uh, the proper excavation to 
preserve the artifacts associated with the 10th Street corridor of the foundations found at the 1908 race ride. So just so you're not caught off guard, I did mention that too. In the IDOT agreement, uh, we're working out where there is going to be dollars allocated for that particular site. I think that Springfield site, we should be in control of that situation. We have the, we own the city property. I don't want to be caught up in a federal uh, bureaucracy. So I've reached out to the NAACP, uh, Teresa Haley, and they're in favor of uh, having it excavated and preserved, as well as the Faith Coalition for the Common Good. Uh, but we need to do what's best for the city of Springfield and uh, you know, not get caught up in all these other uh, situation so those were the two items I mentioned to the reporter and uh, so I apologize if that caught you off guard but uh, be on fair warning that we're going to come back with additional initiatives to do annexations like we did in Ward 3 to annex the holes in the donuts and we will bring forward uh, annexations that make sense for the progression of the city of Springfield since the firefighters were outside the city, we don't have to worry about the residency thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll be coming forward too. But it's all in the, you know, it, what we want is there's only one last chance to bite at the apple with residency, and we want to make sure it passes. It should pass, but uh, we're going to put on the full court press to make sure it does happen. I hear you. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. All in favor? Aye. To take Wait. it to debate, all Let's in favor? Re refresh my memory. What we're it was doing here? The motion was to put it to debate. Which 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 ordinance? One thirty one. One thirty one. Thank you very much. You're the chairman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Herman's throwing me off. No, I'm getting you back on track, right? <laughs> 2016, 148, an ordinance amending Chapter 36, Section 36.35 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to appointments and promotions. Move for debate. Second. Can somebody tell us what this is about? Please. Good evening. Um, it was at the request of the administration that uh, Human Resources put forth an ordinance to require that a city employee complete their probationary period satisfactorily and become certified before they would be able to apply for other positions. Uh, we've been seeing a lot where an employee may only be in a job for one or two or three months and start applying out to other jobs, uh, feeling that we don't really have a good enough um, per performance record at that point. Right. So what, the, what is the term? Is it like six months or? Um, initial new hire term uh, for a promotion, probationary period is one year, for a promotion is six months. And people are applying, as soon as they get one job, they're applying for the next jobs? It's, it's pretty quick. Okay, I agree with that. Now that is, as a state employee, I, there's Wait a two minute. different states things. all messed up. I know. <laughs> there's two different ways of looking at how this would work. In one case, when you come in and you are a state employee, you get preferential, you get first chance at an internal before a person from outside does once you pass your, your probationary period. However, when you're still in your trainee or intern or, or a part time status, you can still apply as an off-the-street person and not have the added benefit of getting the state employee <coughs> fast track. Um, is this preventing someone from applying for a job and being treated as an off-the-street person while they're in probation? It would possibly allow an off-the-street person to obtain a job over a city of Springfield person. Because, in their I, do you, but you understand what I'm saying? Yes. I'm, what, I, what I would like to see, and I don't know how the other all of them feel, is that I don't think that a person should be punished for being a current city employee if they're what, I, what my job would term as underemployed. They have a degree or they have experience that's above the position they're in, but they took the job because they needed a job. And if a position came open, it would prevent them from applying for something that they're qualified for because they haven't finished their probationary period on the under job. 
And I would rather see something where if they're still in that probationary period, they would be treated as an off the street applicant. Well, that assumes that there's preference for city employees internally, of which there is not. Okay. So that doesn't work that way at the city. No. All things are, are even for off the street. The, the only time that, that would be different is if there is some union contract language that specifically states, like ask me for example, that they have it in their contract that we must look at internal ask me uh, employees first before we can consider anyone else. So okay. in, in those cases that would. Then I guess my follow-up question for you would be, in the last year, how many people have come in in their probationary or, or trainee status and then received, applied, and took another job? I'd have to get that for you. I don't have a report on that. But, okay. you know, there is an expense to hiring people and training them, get them ready for the position. So it's not just about having preference. It's about there's a lot of different variables that's, that's that taken into consideration. And, you know, for some, from somebody to jump from job to job to job, you know, let's see what you can do with this job before we get decided to make you the boss. You know what I mean? Alderman Plagenzi. If there's no preferential treatment to a city employee from one job to another, what difference does it make? It's just like applying from off the street, and everybody has that right. So I don't see what the, why we would uh, not want them to apply for a different job. Again, I think it's just for management to get a good sense of what type of employee this, this person is before going toward a higher level position. But if they're being engaged as someone just off the street based on their resume, Same thing. I would think that you would have no, no way to deny them the right to apply. It'd be, it'd be uh, discrimination. And that would mis give Mr. Craven's another <laughs> case. <laughs> Just a comment. Oh, well, we'll talk about it next week. I guess, Mr. Zirkel, if you could follow up on that. Um, I had some of the similar concerns as what Mr. Valdenzi just voiced. For one, certainly. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Ayes have it. 2016 150, an ordinance authorizing decrease the number of Class C1 liquor licenses by one and authorizing an increase and the number of Class B1 liquor licenses by one for Shiri Kabash Shanjan Dev Corporation, DBA, Supermart, 901 East Cook Street. Motion to table. Second. Motion to table and a second. Any, any discussion? No, you can't discuss on a table, right? Correct. That's right, Chairman. I'm getting there. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Present. <coughs> Noted. Ayes have it. 2016-151, an ordinance authorizing Addendum C to extend the date of redevelopment agreement to October 1st, 2016, with the Salvation Army previously authorized by Ordinance 364-11-11 and amended by Ordinances 315-09-13 and 2000 or 214-06-14. Motion for debate. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Yes, please. Um, Sandy Robbins is not here this evening, is he? <coughs> All right. Um, well, I guess, Mr. McCarty, I guess this will kind of go toward you, and you can follow up with Sandy. Um, Wake up. What we're looking at here is the previous city council, and I, I looked into it, and I was correct in my thought that the previous city council did question the Houston administration about the purchase of this building for the Y block and its proximity to the railroad tracks. <coughs> And I guess my question would be whether it was the purchasing department missing something last time or if something has changed between now and then to where we're looking at exactly what the previous city council was worried about, about moving the, the Salvation Army. Can you clarify something? You said the Y block. Did you mean? Salvation Army. Okay. I, I'm sick. I, I'm sorry. No, I just want to make sure. I already called Frank a girl. You know, I, I just mean, want to make sure I'm <laughs> understanding correctly. Wow. It's getting a little ugly up there. This is, this is. Sure, yeah. Alderman. I will look into that and have some answers for you next week. Yeah, and like I said, it's just when this came up in the press, and this has absolutely nothing to do with this administration. This goes back to the previous one, and I, I knew the previous council had questioned that purchase 
and now it's coming back to bite us. Alderman Donnell. I have a question of Corporation Council regarding Addendum C. I noticed under number three it discusses or has language about relocation cost. Are those, and uh, I believe when the mayor mentioned the possible potential sites that are being talked about, some of them were in the TIF district, some were not. Uh, if the site that's ultimately chosen is different from the one that they presently have and it's outside the TIF district, are TIF funds allowed to be used for relocation costs if they locate outside the district? Um, I will uh, look into that. I think generally the answer would be no. But I'll, I'll be sure to uh, check the statute exactly. Uh, some are in, some are out. Uh, but whatever steps are taken, we would have to comply with the TIF Act. Thank you. Mr. Chair, for, uh, further discussion. Uh, Bill McCarty, could you check also uh, when the Y purchased this building, which had been Salvation used. Salvation. That's Salvation Army. Army. <laughs> when Salvation <laughs> Army purchased this building, which had been used by Horace Mann for offices, were any uh, public funds used? Uh, could you check on that? Sure. I thought I'll it was a private uh, party purchase. Thank you. Okay, motion is for a debate. All in favor? Mr. Chairman. Aye. Oh, Aye. oh, I'm sorry, hold yeah, on. One last. Will we know before, what, April 4th or April 5th, next time we come back, of where they might choose to relocate? I guess that's a question for the mayor or, uh, or Corporation Council. It may be more of a question for the Salvation Army. Or for Salvation Army. Put your realtor hat on. That's right. <laughs> Well, we did meet with the Salvation Army on Sunday, and uh, that's one of the requests I put forward that if they decide to stay with their current location, if they uh, want to move to one of the proposed properties, <coughs> that they would let us know by April 5th, because I know the council would be interested in knowing which direction they plan on taking. So just a reminder to everybody that um, I had approached the Salvation Army to see if uh, they'd be interested in moving. Originally, when I first got into office, I asked them if they, as close to the tracks were they concerned, and they said no, they were uh, content on where they were, and that's because of the time and the difficulty it took them to find the current location. So through time, you know, I asked them uh, right uh, before, you know, right after they started uh, doing some remodeling work and uh, told them, you know, our concerns being close to the track, the intermodal hub and that. And then they said they would be interested if, uh, if there is a feasible property to move to. So that's where we're at. So if they don't, do not like one of the alternate uh, locations proposed, they can stay where they're at. So that's uh, what's on the table with them. But I did ask them to come uh, with a um, remedy or what direction they'd like to take by April 5th. So that's uh, hopefully they'll be able to do that. Could you ask them to be here, I guess, on April 5th? Sure. That would be helpful. Yep. Mayor, was there money given to the Salvation Army through the t out of the TIF fund? To uh, I'll let uh, Karen come up and answer that. I think it was around $70,000, but um, I know they submitted a lot of disbursements or requests, but uh, there's only a limited amount that qualified. Yes, they submitted uh, roughly about $400,000 worth of receipts, and of that total amount, only 71000 was reimbursable. Um, mm -hmm. Back when this ordinance was uh, uh, put in place, I believe it was 2011, did they get an initial bump of like a million eight? The initial ordinance was for $1.8 And then um, it's my understanding there was no movement in terms of either And that was for remodeling costs? Right. Okay. Right. And then um, I believe the first time it came, um, the um, ordinance expired, then it was reduced to a little over a million dollars. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and to answer uh, Alderman Redpath's question, I, th I think it is correct to say that no money was used for the acquisition of the building from TIF. If that, if that okay. was your I, I assume that was the yeah. remodeling cost expense. Right. It was our understanding that the building was actually purchased from the National Salvation Army okay. uh, organization. Mm -hmm. Alderman Donnell. And maybe I'm getting the carpet for the horse director, but mm -hmm. if, if they purchase the money with the Salvation Army funds and they're interested in moving to another facility, do we, would we have to wait for them to sell that building to get the funds to purchase the new one? Uh, just trying to get a handle on chain of events and maybe you don't have the answer but yeah I actually don't have the answer to that because since we were not engaged 
you know, in the purchase of the building at all. You know, our money will go to refurbishing a building, you know, for the you know, their homeless services. So. I just remember how difficult it was to find that uh, in a location that was acceptable uh, right. for, right. you know, different, many different groups in the city, mm -hmm. including Salvation Army. And uh, still wondering, they knew at that time, and we had discussions back in 2009 that the railroad, we wanted the 10th Street corridor, and it was going to be expanded, and I thought we were well past that, but I guess not. With regards to that, uh, that will be part of the equation Salvation Army figures in is to uh, the sell of that property that they're in, you know, because that's going to be part of the uh, uh, revenue stream that will allow them to move. You know, that's going to be figured into their equation just like with anybody. You're going to figure in what you can get for that piece of property to uh, make it affordable to move. So they're going to try to uh, weigh in on all the different uh, aspects of uh, the potential new location and make a determination if it's in their best interest to move or not. Mayor, if they choose a, a different location, mm -hmm. does this ordinance, does your understanding of this ordinance give them up to what, one million, whatever it is, to move to that or to assist in that, mm -hmm. that move right. without us knowing what the location is presently? In other words, let's say that, you know, there was a big controversy, it's no secret, mm -hmm. we're going to move across from the cemetery and, you know, uh, it was, anyway, right. history right. in the papers. Um, you know, does this give a blanket, uh, blanket TIF assistance? I guess it's only if they're in the TIF district, but to, to go anywhere within the TIF district, or I would have to, uh, as Corporation Counsel for the interpretation of the ordinance. I think what the alderman's asking is uh, the way it's if it's passed, and uh, are we tied into the million dollars for a move if it doesn't meet City Council approval on the property relocation? If they're out of the TIF, yeah, would they need additional approval? As far as location, or are we agreeing? The this would give them the option of using that money consistent with the TIF requirements, consistent with the TIF requirements for renovation or for potential relocation. Anywhere within the district, it would have to comply with the TIF requirements. Thank you. So wait a minute, clarify that for me. So if, even if they move outside of a TIF district, they can use no, these funds anywhere inside. No. Oh, they the have TIF to. District. They have to stay in the TIF district. Mm -hmm. But that also opens a can of worms of they could choose a building that's within the TIF district that we may have already had a fight on <laughs> and we would not as aldermen have any influence over whether or not they could purchase that building. You're funny, Chris. I'm not I even talking about that area. I'm talking okay. about another one. Okay, thank you. Alderman Turner. He's got a pool. I think, I think that the mayor has, addre has addressed those concerns because he has said that he asked Salvation Army to make their make their decision by April 5th and to be here on April 5th, and that's when we would be voting on this. So I think that he's addressed all of those concerns. That's a good point, Alderman. I appreciate that clarification. Mm -hmm. I intend on voting for it this evening. Thanks. And we'll have them here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Director. Okay, all in favor of uh, moving it to debate? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Ayes have it. So, no. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion to move 2016-132 to the end of the ordinance. I was going to make that motion. You can make the second. <laughs> second. Oh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. CWLP, 2016-133, an ordinance accepting the bid and authorizing the execution of contract UW 16-01-71 ductile t iron pipe with Illinois Meter Incorporated in the amount not to exceed $814,234.12 for the Office of Public Luke Utilities. Sam. Any discussion? It was, is this a bid bid? This was a Yes. Cool. Okay. okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-134, an ordinance accepting bids and authorizing the execution of contract UW 16-01-70, water main gate and tapping valves with American Flow Control, a division of American Cast Iron Pipe Company, for a one-year term in the amount not to exceed $373,941 for the Office of Public Utilities. Move to consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 
2016-135, an ordinance authorizing payment of membership dues to American Public Power Association in the amount of $53,744.40 for the Office of Public Utilities. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Opposed? 216-136, an ordinance approving a one-year con <coughs> contract extension under contract number UW10-01-92 with HD Supply Water Works LTD for the purchase of fire hydrants for a total amount not to exceed $1,743,110 for the Office of Public Utilities. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-137, an ordinance approving a telecommunications contract service agreement with Green Family Stores Incorporated for several locations for the Office of Public Utilities. Move to consent. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, what is, can you explain this a little further? What's this going to do for the city? Yes, that means you're coming up. This is the uh, telecommunication agreement with Green Toyota or all the green stores for uh, wireless services or internet services that we provide, this our had, fiber. This had to do with Midas Copeland? It's one of, it I'll, may, I'll vote, I don't think one of his stores is involved. Vote, no, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going right there. Any other discussion? All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-152, an ordinance amending Chapter 50 of the 1988 <coughs> City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended regarding electric utility and fuel adjustment calculation for the Office of Public Utilities. Move to debate. Second. 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 <coughs> Any discussion? I would like to know what uh, what we're doing with the fuel adjustment. Somebody can come up and let us know if we're adding or subtracting. Can we save that for the presentation? Or do you need to explain to you now? We can save it for the presentation, I guess. So there's a few guys. You're the chairman, man. Mr. Chair, there's a, a real factual question I have about this. If, you, if we couldn't address it now. Okay, we can address it now. No problem. Thank you. This would raise regulatory environmental initiative costs. Do you have any rough estimate of how much cost we would need to raise through the fuel adjustment to handle regulatory and environmental initiatives? Well, yeah, for the, yeah, for the, the, the presentation I want to show you, basically, the, the projects that we're looking at that range from 20 to $60 million. So this initiative that we're trying to do with this ordinance is going to raise about $3.3 million a year. Okay, so that's not going to be enough to cover all of those projects if they come to fruition. But it also depends on, the, on the, basically some of the options that are required. Um, that we're still, we're still running through that, but we know that there's a minimum there's going to be at least $20 million in the future. And have you got those uh, regulatory projects listed somewhere where we have a disclosure of those projects? Right, yeah. Yeah, we're going to cover that, too, in the presentation. Okay. Like the ash ponds is one of them. So, okay. so there are two, you have two presentations for tonight? No, it's, no, it's, it's one, one presentation, but we're covering both ordinances, the, the coal contract and as the initiatives, uh, basically the modifications to the fuel adjustment. Are they, how are they connected? It's basically the, the savings that we're, we're getting from the, the, the difference in price from uh, the coal savings from $39 down to $35.90, and then the same thing with ash going from $16 to $5. So I, I'll, I'll explain that in the presentation. I understand that, but I don't know about anybody else, but for me, those two should be separated out because I don't know that there's been a decision made on what, what, we're, what was going to happen with that savings. So I think that we should talk about the call contract and what's happening with that, and then we can talk about the fuel adjustment issue and what you would need, what you would need for that, and what projects you're, you're looking at working on. Again, this is a the presentation is going to basically show you what the analysis is, and that's the first part is really the coal contract. The last part of it is going to be gearing towards the this oh, yeah. code change for the fuel adjustment. But again, I. For me, they're two separate issues. They are. They, they are. They're, that's so why there's two different so, ordinances. So I don't know why, if they're two separate issues, two separate ordinances, I don't know why we're combining them in one presentation. To, to me, that's com it's confusing. I, I, I need things pretty simple. One of, one of the things I, I would like to do, I, I know there's a motion on the table, but I would like to hold this in committee so we can discuss it after we go through the coals that I think we're putting the cart motion before the horse. This ordinance to the end of the agenda. Second. Oh, what was it? 
move it to the end of the agenda after we'll the coal contract. Okay. We'll discuss this ordinance after we discuss the coal uh, reopener. Okay. We've got a motion. Any discussion got, on that? You got well, two things to deal with now. Debate. Yeah, we should, should we move on that then vote on that motion first? The debate. Yeah, well, we he just oh, withdrew it. I, I withdrew, withdrew it. Oh, okay. okay. All in favor of moving this to the end? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, we also have uh, 216 094 95 and 96. Mr. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. 2016 094, an ordinance authorizing a contract between the City of Springfield and Nesbitt Enterprises, LLC, for the purchase and sale of real estate located at 1613 North 11th Street for an amount not to exceed $117,500 and relocation expenses and closing costs not to exceed $70,188 for a total amount not to exceed $187,000. Six hundred and eighty-eight dollars. Move to consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All ayes have it. 2016-095, an ordinance authorizing a contract between the City of Springfield and Charles Bellamy for the purchase and sale of real estate located at the 1005 block Black Avenue for an amount not to exceed $35,625 and relocation expenses and closing costs not to exceed $34,594 for a total amount not to exceed seventy thousand two hundred nineteen dollars. Move to consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Two Ayes have it. 2016-096, an ordinance authorizing a contract between the City of Springfield and Donald E. Farley and Eurlis D. Farley for a purchase and sale of real estate located at 1645 North 11th Street for an amount not to exceed $120,000 and relocation expenses and closing costs not to exceed $12,238 for a total amount not to exceed $132,238. Move to consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. 2016-132, an ordinance approving and restated an amended contract for the sale and purchase of coal which Arch Coal Sales and Company Incorporated, including the terms of the 2016 coal price redetermination for the Office of Public Utilities. Move for debate. Second. Second. Any discussion? I guess we have, uh, um, I think. Are Roger, you letting them do their presentations now? Or? Yeah, I think, Roger, you signed up. <coughs> ready, ready so, if it. I thought Doug Brown was going to do a presentation on this. I was going to let him go last. Oh, okay. I just That's all right. Roger, go ahead. State your name and address. Roger Dennison with Foresight Energy. <clears throat> uh, just handed out a couple pages here. Uh, the first point we want to make, Thank again, you. we've you know, spent a lot of time here the past month or so talking about it that the arch price and ordinance 2016-132 will cost the rate payers nearly $32.5 million additional over the next five years compared to Foresight's public bid. The additional cost of this ordinance to rate payers in the next two years, as we discussed, I believe, last week, is over $17 million in the, in the next two years. And I brought some charts and we looked at the stuff. I mean, you're still, there's still a difference. The mine price to match ours for the next two years is $28.70, not $35.90. And we can go into that more if we want, but we've discussed that, I think, plenty in the past. Foresight's coal has a higher heating value, produces less ash, and contains lower sulfur dioxide per million BTU when compared to Arches coal. Foresight's coal produces 25 to 30 percent less ash per million BTU and contains 50 percent less chlorine per million BTU than the arch coal. Foresight was asked to uh, provide a delivered ash price and added add that to the RFP bid. Foresight's cost for ash disposal will be the same or less than arch. And Alderman Redpath, when you asked me that question that night, the price was the $14, but I did it at the new price of five bucks. So, okay. So you. it's we made it the same. And again, the reason I say less, when you look into our ash, our coal will produce 32, 000, over 32,000 tons a year less ash than the Viper ash. Foresight can meet any of the CWLP uh, needs that they have. We have four coal mines in Illinois currently operating. 
with a capacity of over 20 million tons annually. Foresight has answered all requests for information from city officials and we're still waiting for the opportunity to come and negotiate and prevent or and offer up our best and final offer. I want to say one more thing again we talked about and, and I'll actually show it on the next chart again when I brought up earlier that these 45 percent price increases we've seen since the 07 to current was again because we not only skipped reopeners but we also took outright a first refusal. You need to pay attention that's not in this current contract proposal and I'll get into that in a little bit but it's very important you can do it I've talked about how to do that you just this contract says they get all requirements you don't have to do that you can set a base tons and put the other out for right of first refusal again it's still their contract they can match whatever bids come in folks that's what was used before to keep equilibrium until the next market reopener so I'll uh, move on from there uh, Mr. Zirkle, I, I do want to say publicly, we were asked to extend our bid to March 31st, sir, and I didn't know if we were going to get together about doing something beyond March 31st, but uh, just publicly I want to tell you we'll extend that uh, for sure to the April 5th, and if we need something beyond that, you know, we, we should discuss that. But I just want to let you know, and if you need, sir, we'll follow up with a letter. Um, the next chart, you guys have seen, I'm not going to get crazy with it, the big thing is the red circle again to the right. You've got to equate this heat, these different heat values, again, on a cents per million BTU. You've seen this before. I'm not going to beat this horse to death. So $1.57 a million BTU delivered, that's how you equate both of these. So when you look at that, it says for the five-year deal, again, the mine price, the price at the mine should be $30.49, not $35.90. So I did stick a little chart in there that you can see the 3590 that's in this proposal in the transportation. And then I stuck a little chart down here at the bottom, and I'm sorry, I did this right before I came, so the blue box covered up one number in the chart. I apologize. I mean, I'm, I'm my own secretary, which isn't good all the time. Uh, but what it shows is since 1983 to 2001, because of those reopeners and because of right of first refusal, this price actually went down 13% in that 18 years. We quit doing reopeners. We quit doing right of first refusal in 07, and it's went up 45%. These same ratepayers we're talking about hitting for another 32 and a half million bucks over the next five years paid this. Now we're sitting talking about where we're going to take it to, and we're not taking it to where we need to take it to, folks. So that's my point on that. Um, I do say when you look at the, at the little chart to the right, the little red bars of 27 through 2015, again, Part of that was skipping reopeners. Remember, requirements tons always escalated. You guys have done a good job, I'll say, inside the verbiage I've seen in the current proposal, you've taken out some of these things. Escalation, this and that, it's a fixed price, so we talked about that last week. But the key there is that right of first refusal and also uh, the escalation. So I'm still saying you need to look at right of first refusal. I put on there arbitration was skipped. We still say that when we look at the RFP bid, we, were ba we bid that thing and we still maintain we bid it based on complying with the contract terms and conditions that were attached to that RFP bid. It was a bid. It's not evidence for a reopener. It clearly said it's an RFP bid. So we bid that. And it said inside there you shall conduct negotiations or they could conduct negotiations again to get us to come in to do the best and final offer. We've not been awarded that opportunity yet. We did say we'd comply with all terms of that contract. Well, inside that contract, it also says you will go to arbitration, non-binding arbitration, if you don't have a deal and pick arbitrators. I'm not going through that. We've discussed that enough in here. One key thing, too, we did bid through 2035. Folks keep saying about a short-term deal or going away and not having a competitor. Well, you've got a competing bid right now. What are we doing with it? But if a, you've said if, we, if, if a competitor goes away, we bid this through 2035. I've made a statement. If you want to bid it through 2055, again, let's come and talk about it, folks. So it's out there to be talked about. Um, I have read the proposed contract. I ask you folks, too, to take a look inside it. There's money inside it, too. When you look at the price that these folks are saying they're going to do for the mine, you start looking, it's a 10,450 BTU. Really, they're shipping over 10,5s. Not kicking them for it. I say there's some value there. If I read the sulfur penalty correctly, it's half what it was before. There's some money there. So the best I can see, you're talking 50, 60 more cents a ton that's buried in there. 
that will automatically come as soon as you ship the first ton of coal. And I'd be more than glad to go through that later. But that's about three and a half, three point six million dollars more over the next five years that's buried in that contract. Um, I'll maintain also we did, we've talked about it, you've seen enough, it was in the last handout to the foresight letter. We want to come in here, we want to talk, we want to talk about assisting in the operation of maintenance costs, the other maintenance costs and any required capital to maintain this plan and make sure that we can meet all the environmental compliance through 2035. So we're still going to come and do that. It was part of our RFP and that's where we're at. So we stand behind our bid. We're willing to sign that right now, put on paper. The numbers we said, instead of throwing away 32 and a half million bucks over the next five years. And folks, again, we didn't bid this thing to be stalking hooks. If we'd have got a piece of paper that says, hey, send us some evidence what the Illinois market is, I'm going to say, well, go find it at the EIA or someplace else. This truly said it was a bid. And if you can live up the terms and conditions of this contract, you've got a chance to get it awarded. So I ask you really hard. We all know how the two-year thing works. That two-year thing you need to weave in at least right of first refusal. You can give X amount of base tons to somebody, but why miss the opportunity, again, to get the price down? So I'll quit talking. I know we're going to talk a little bit later. I respectfully request that, you know, if there's some issues or some questions I have when Mr. Brown does his presentation that we're allowed to at least ask, sir. I appreciate it. I'm done unless there's any questions. Is there any questions? Oh, I guess, Turner. I don't know if, if I don't know if, if I should ask this question now or wait until, I'll wait until the presentation because maybe the, it'll be answered. In there. Okay. Is there Anybody a helper? Um, Mr. Zirkel, is there anything that you can respond to at this time or do you want to wait? No, I mean, if, if the aldermen have questions later, I'll be happy to try to uh, address them. All right, thank you. I appreciate it, folks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Arch, Cole. Good evening. Certainly appreciate the chance to address the city council members uh, regarding the coal contract with the city utility. Um, my name's John Ziegler. I'm the chief commercial officer for Arch Coal. Thank you. Uh, and with me this evening is Rowdy Smith, our senior vice president of sales, and Bob Gardner, director of sales. Um, since Mr. Brown's going to uh, address many of the specific contract details, what I thought I would do a bit here is address uh, Arch some of the bankruptcy concerns that you all may have given recent proceedings, uh, some discussion about Viper Mine and its importance in the community, and then lastly, just a few comments about the contract itself. So as I look at page three, uh, I did want to uh, uh, point this out because I think it is relevant to my comments regarding our bankruptcy. Arch is one of the largest coal producers in the United States. Uh, in 2015, we produced about 129 million tons of coal across all basins. And the reason I think that's important is as you think about your concerns and whether you would be concerned, um, we are very diversified. We're not uh, dependent on one single mine from one single region. We're a very diversified coal supply. From Viper in particular, we produced about 2.1 million tons in 2015. As it relates to Arch's culture as a company, which I think is important to address, which is on slide four, safety and environmental compliance are our top priorities. Period, number one, no exceptions. And if you look at uh, what's on this slide in front of you, our safety performance and our environmental compliance performance, you'll see that ARCH is second to none. Basically, we set uh, a safety compliance rate in 2015 of a 0.99 total incident rate on 200,000 man hours work, uh, which basically is not only a company record, but it was an industry record. Again, our demonstration and our commitment to safety is second to none. The same is true on the environmental side. Um, the way we're measured on the environmental side has to do with violations against SMACRA permits. In 2015, we had four violations for our entire company. When you look across the industry, that is an industry-leading performance. Our commitment to environmental compliance is second to none. In particular, also, specifically to Viper, uh, and I've got a slide on Viper safety coming up here, but. Uh, relative to Viper's compliance uh, on the environmental side, Viper has only received one NOV since, 20, uh, since we've taken the mine over in 2011. And in the past three years, there's only been one water quality exceedance on numerous, if not thousands, of water quality samples uh, taken from this mine. So again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is 
to be safe and environmentally sound. As it relates to the Chapter 11 reorganization process, I understand there's some questions. One of the things I need to emphasize the most is that our restructuring process is a financial restructuring process. We don't have operational issues. We don't have mines that are problems. We don't have mines we need to close. Quite frankly, anything that we needed to do in that regard has been done. And since 2012, when the markets turned down, uh, we've shuttered any of those operations that we needed to. All the operations that we have are cash flow positive operations. We quite frankly have an unsustainably high level of debt. This restructuring process is intended to do that. Throughout the process, we've, we've received all of the uh, approvals we need for all the motions to continue as a company as normal. Uh, we currently have in excess of $900 million of liquidity. Uh, that's broken down between roughly 620 some odd million in cash and 275 million in debtor and possession financing. So I want to assure you that we have plenty of liquidity to be able to serve this contract uh, for the near future and for the future to come. Uh, the other item I guess I would like to mention is that when we emerge, and again, we're a financial restructuring, without the excessively high debt, we will be a much stronger financial company and uh, a much more competitive company in the future landscape. We, we, as you probably all know, are not the only company going through this. Uh, a lot of companies uh, will not be immune to the issue that we face given uh, current coal markets. Slide seven, just meant to give you a brief history on the fact that we have been uh, a major producer and continue to be a major producer in the Illinois Basin. We currently have 335 million tons of reserves with active mining operations at Viper. We also have a 49% interest in Nighthawk. And um, uh, we have had large, large scale surface mines in Illinois through the past that are in fact mined out. As it relates to Viper's uh, safety history, history specifically, again, I can't emphasize en enough how important it is to be a safe coal miner. If you look on this chart, what this chart shows you is from the time of the acquisition in 2011, what our incident rate was down to where we sit today on a three-year average. Our three-year average is an industry-leading 1.17 incident rate on 200,000 man-hours work. Uh, for comparison purposes, the underground mine um, industry as a whole in Illinois is about 5.62. So we are currently about 3.8 times better than uh, the, the industry at large. As it relates to Viper itself, we believe Viper is a, one of the cornerstone industries to the city of Springfield. We have approximately 300 uh, miners along with their families. They live in this community. Uh, obviously, they work in this community. They spend their money in this community. They send their children to this community. Uh, there are 51 specific uh, employees uh, along with their families that live in the city proper, and all the other miners live in the five-county geographic area. So we've been a part of this community a long time. Viper Mine spends $52 million a year, roughly, much of which accrues to the benefit of the city of Springfield. The other issue I guess I wanted to, to mention is uh, we've had some questions about capital and capital expenditures in the past. Since Arch has purchased ICG and taken Viper Mine over, we've spent $55.9 million on, cap on capital expenditures, on, on new loadouts, on the overland conveyor belt. So we've invested heavily in this mine. And the reason we've invested heavily in this mine is that we anticipate and want to be the supplier for CWLP for years to come. Excuse me, for years to come. Uh, obviously, this benefits other customers as well, but CWLP, in fact, is the anchor, is the anchor customer for the Viper mine. As it relates to the uh, coal contract specifically, I guess one of the best things I can say is that we have serviced the city for 32 years in an, in an uninterrupted manner. There have not been supply issues. Uh, we have a strong relationship with the city utility. We have a strong relationship with the city. Uh, we think that we obviously have, have shown that over time. We'd like to continue that. As it relates to the ash disposal, there is nothing needed for us to manage the ash disposal for the full five years of this agreement. We have everything in place, all the permits, there are going to be no issues with that. The other thing I would say is um, to the comment about price, obviously we've reduced the price a little over $9 a ton through extensive negotiations. And the final slide that I would present is on 
uh, slide 11 as it relates to the contract itself. And I would like to specifically address what the contract calls for. The contract says that you can reopen the price or have a price redetermination periodically. That's what we've done. That's what the city's done. We've negotiated vigorously. We've negotiated for a long time. We've had ongoing, ongoing negotiations since February of 2015. There have been many iterations of this. And what, what the agreement doesn't call for is a repeated series of bids to keep coming in. It calls for the establishment of a fair market value as based on commitments. That's specifically what the contract says. And we believe that we've done that. We believe the city's done that. Um, I would say that we've finally mutually agreed. There's no provision that says you have to exercise the arbitration process. You can always negotiate until the very end. That's exactly what we've done. Uh, on the side chart here, this gives you an idea of the blue bar represents what's the contract price uh, at 3590. The red bars are, in fact, publicly stated uh, price per tons achieved by our competitors in the Illinois Basin. And you can see that 3590 is below all of the current prices as reported in 10Ks for our competitors um, uh, in the Illinois Basin. So we believe we've achieved that. We believe also that we have followed the contract explicitly and to the letter of the contract. Um, with that, I would just say thanks on behalf of the Viper Mine and its 300 employees for giving me the opportunity to address you this evening. Thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or if you want to wait. <coughs> Is there any questions? Alderman Turner? I have a, a couple of questions. Yes. Um, very specifically, have there been any layoffs or staff reductions in the past 90 days at Viper? Or do you anticipate any in the in the near future? Um, the answer to that is we've not had any specific uh, rifts at the mine. Um, the only reason that there would be in the future, we're fully committed at the mine. Um, the, the agreement that we have is a requirements agreement with the city. I don't anticipate that there would be, but if for some reason the city were to curtail its requirements uh, considerably, that could possibly lead to that. But the answer is no. We've not had any rifts at Viper Mine. Okay, and then my last question is, can you adjust the comparison in the, um, I'm not a coal person, so I, I, sure. I just need to see the comparison. The comparison between um, your coal and uh, what Foresight is proposing when they talk about higher heating value and um, less, yeah, the sulfur content and um, the less ash and less chlorine and why that's important. So um, I would say there are a lot of qualities in coal that are important. Um, so our coal does happen to run at about a 10, 550 to a 10, 6 BTU. Um, we do have a low chlorine coal as compared to other competitors in the basin. I don't believe that that would be an issue. And on a pounds per million uh, ash content of sulfur, uh, it's uh, been managed um, very well by the utility as it sits today. Again, there are other qualities that are important. For example, we could talk about the grind of the coal, how hard the coal is. Uh, the city's mills are currently um, configured to manage the grind of, of Viper coal. Having a different grind would cause additional costs. So there are a lot of things. So you just can't say this, this quality or that quality equals this difference uh, in the coal. Um, so the coals are substantially similar. Um, basically, again, there's going to be some heating value difference. There's going to be sulfur value difference, but there are going to be a number of other things that will be different. But they're, in general, going to be uh, similar with, again, some differences in characteristics on grind and other things. Herman? Um, in going through your bankruptcy reorganization and yes. your finances, are there things that you've had to modify at the mine at this present time that will affect the working conditions there? Absolutely not. Again, we, we have heavily invested capital in this mine. Uh, all the permits that we have will enable us to fully satisfy this agreement through the extension of the term <coughs> through 2020. There's nothing that's needed as we sit here today. Uh, there's not additional capital that's needed. Um, as it relates to in the future, would we put additional capital into the, into the mine? That's part of the process of mining. There's always going to be new capital included. But as we sit here today, there's no capital that's needed in order to continue to service this contract to its fullest. Thank you. Mr. Donnell. 
Mr. Ziegler, yes. I'm curious to the, if you have the number. My understanding is since the mine is, excuse me, since the coal is taken out of the mine at Sangamon, in Sangamon County, that there are revenues that go back to the county government itself, which of course includes the citizens of Springfield. Is, is there a figure? Do we have a 3%? Yeah, I, I apologize. I don't have that exact number off the top of my head. Uh, we may have that in one of our documents here. The, uh, the exact amount back to Sangamon County? Yes. Yeah, and if you don't have it right now, that's fine. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be up to the final vote. If it moves on to, for two weeks, but we'd like, I'd like to have that. Yes. Alderman McClendon. Um, Mr. Ziegler, this yes. question I think that I'll ask will also be addressed by Doug Brown, but I just want to get your overall uh, uh, take on the question. Um, you heard the presentation of Foresight uh, just before yours. And so Foresight makes this statement that the arch price in this ordinance will cost ratepayers an additional $32 million over the next five years compared to the Foresight bid. How do you respond to that statement? So I would respond to that statement this way. The contract calls for a very specific process for determining the price of coal. The bid that you have in front of you would be what we would be consider a predatorily priced bid. It does not represent the fair market value of the coal. That is not what the contract calls for. That's how I would respond to that question. It says that we have to come up with a fair market value as determined by commitments. That's what we've done. And if you look at the commitments that are publicly stated on our competitors' financial documents, the prices are clearly higher than that. So will this ordinance cost our ratepayers $32 million in excess of what we could do with foresight? Uh, I don't think that's the way that I would look at that. I would say that um, there was a comment made about the city foregoing price reopeners. One of the things that I might um, bring up to the city council is there was a price reopener in 2011. Arch had the chance at that point in time to raise the price of the coal given the coal markets at that point. Uh, our coal price was a couple dollars below market at that point. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the utility went out for bid and received no competing bids because all the competitors felt there was a better price uh, to achieve somewhere else. We did not raise our bid. We let the escalation stay in place. So over the long-term nature of this agreement, which has spanned 32 years, there are going to be times where you will pay a little more and there's going to be times when you pay a little less. That's the nature of a long-term agreement. I would tell you that from the time of 2011 forward to about 2013, your coal price, because there was no other offer to come out, and we did not seek to raise that. Um, you saved that money at that point in time as well. So what I would suggest is that you can't look at this in two two-year windows. You have to look at this over the span of time of this agreement and the benefit to the city over that span of time, Mr. Ziegler, which again is oh, going to be close to 40 years by the time this is Chairman, over. I got a follow-up. Okay, go ahead, Joe. Um, so the second bullet on the uh, presentation from Foresight is a similar type of uh, comment. It says the additional cost of this ordinance that we're considering now to ratepayers in the next two years is $17 million compared to Foresight's public bid. How do you respond to that statement? Well, I would respond that I'm not sure that, based on that statement, that you actually know what the cost is. Um, there are going to be differences in operational cost at the unit. There's going to be limestone differences. There's going to be potentially equipment costs to, to retrofit some of the units in order to manage uh, Foresight's coal. So it's not just as simple as the coal price is X and uh, the other coal price is Y and calculate the difference. Well, my last final comment, Mr. Chair, and I'm sure Mr. Brown is going to get into this uh, deeply, but in the next two years, we can't remove ourselves from our contract with you. As, so I don't, I think the ratepayers are confused by this, by the by kind of a statement. I thought you might give a legal type answer that we can't escape uh, the, the contract from um, Arch for at least two years. So. We, we're, we're not interested in the next two years. We're interested in the next five and potentially the next ten after that, quite frankly. If we did go through the arbitration process, Arch's view is that your coal price would actually be higher. It would be higher because there have been multiple bids by Foresight. The first bid by Foresight was, in fact, over the $39 that was agreed to originally. 
So we, we took a look at that. We were competitive. We didn't come to final agreement with the new administration when it came in. But in fact, they've given that bid. That would be looked at uh, in arbitration. The second bid would be looked at. All the data that I've put in front of you relative to the commitments at other uh, competitor mines, not Foresight mines, but all the Illinois Basin mines, would be looked at. And it, it isn't going to be just this bid. I would, I would tell you that our view is that in arbitration, your price would go up significantly above 3590. We're not interested in that. We're interested in securing 300 people's jobs in the city of Springfield and the metro area, the surrounding area, for a minimum of five years to come. That's what's important. That's what we want. Again, we've shown that uh, relationship with the city year after year, and that's what we're looking for going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ziegler, um, yes. you mentioned that uh, you, you currently do not need a permit for our ash, and, but you're having a, uh, there was a, uh, there is either going to be or there was a public forum with EPA to extend, to expand your, your coal, your ash coal pond up in, up, up yeah. north. Um, That's right. As part of, uh, I'm sorry. I should no, go ahead. Um, my, I guess my concern is uh, if you do not get that, will that impair the amount of ash that you can, you can bring in from the city? It would not. It would not. In any mining operation, you're currently permitting new areas for refuse. That uh, new permit would not impede in any way our ability to manage all the ash coming from the city. And Mr. Zirkel, it's my understanding in the contract that if they, if for some reason um, they cannot take the, the ash, we can terminate the contract, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, Alderman Turner? I guess I'm... I was listening to Alderman McMinima's question, and I had was looking for the same explanation. And I know that you talked about you know the 40 years and all of that, but sitting here today, I have to make a decision based on the next five years. I I, I can't go back, and I I can't do any of that. I have to make a decision based on the next five years. So I guess I need to hear from you why this statement is incorrect that that the ratepayers would not incur this additional cost? Well, again, I think what you have to hear is the full economics that Mr. Brown will present as it relates to what it would cost to use that coal in the units. Again, because it's not just the price of coal. It's also the cost of the operations at the units. There are other right. costs involved. Okay, but I guess, I guess what, but what you're presenting on is the cost of coal because, you, because I don't think that you would have a clear understanding about what any of those other costs would be unless you are fully aware of everything that happens at the mine. So I guess I need to hear from you basically about the cost. And then I can then I'll hear from, from um, Doug Brown about the other things. So I need to hear from you basically about, about the cost. And, and, I, and I know that you talk about, and again, I'm just trying to get information so I can make an intelligent decision. And be able sure. to live, and be able to live with the decision that I have to make because it's a it's a far-reaching decision that's going to have a major impact, not only on the city. It's going to have major impact on the ratepayers, and and um, you know there's there's a lot of different levels here. So I understand when you talk about you know the people who work at the mine, but I have to be concerned about Springfield and the ratepayers, of which I am one. So I I need to hear from you specifically about the cost. So I would also say we, contracts have, and this contract has a very specific provision for how this is to be determined. We have followed that contract provision explicitly. It says that we are to seek out a fair market value. And it specifically says that there's one opportunity to get a coal price. In fact, that opportunity, that first opportunity happened back in February of 2015. The price that you received, the city received at that point in time, was in fact above the $39 price, which is above where we're settling at. We believe that our coal price is the fair market value. It's not a predatorily priced value, no. It's a fair market value for the coal as we would sell it into the marketplace at this time. So as it relates to their, their costs or their costs, our costs or our costs, but I say costs, I'm talking about cost of mine. As it relates to specifically what the contract calls for, 
it calls for the redetermination of a fair market value price. That's what we've done. That price is thirty-five ninety, as evidenced by close to fourteen months of negotiation. So you don't think Foresight's price is a fair market price? No, I do not. Why? I think it's a predatorily priced value. I think that what Foresight would like to have, and I understand, would be to have this contract. They don't have this contract. They're willing to pay a below market price to have this contract without Viper in the area. Again, this is the base load agreement for our mine. Supports 300 plus miners and their families. Without the Viper mine and without, uh, without CWLP as a customer, Viper becomes a more difficult mine, quite frankly. We can operate it at half the volume. That may not be what makes the most economic sense, though, for Arch to stay in uh, the region with that mine open. Without Arch as a competitor going forward, there's time in the future to uh, be able to make that up on a higher price. So if they have a bid that they say is good through 2035, you think that they're making this bid now so that they can wait till 2036 and then raise it? I don't have the specifics of their bid through 2036. Well, you heard them, you heard them say that. So. And I would be shocked and surprised if any coal supplier would fix a price between now and 2036. Well, I can only go by... I can only go by what they've said here today. And, which and is, again, I'm not. Which I is, I can only go by wanna, what you've said here today. I don't want to. I don't know what they've done, quite frankly. So what they've done is is their business, and I don't want to refute what what they've done. Our negotiations have been with the city. Our negotiations are not. No, I understand that. But when you when you make allegations like that, I think that it's fair for me to ask you sure. to to tell me why you believe that. So that I was just. I was just asking you to explain your allegation. Um, I'm not sure that I would call it an allegation. What I would say is I don't know specifically what's in there. No, you said that bid. they were doing a predatory oh, bid. Oh, yes. That, yes, I would say that. Yes. I'm sorry. As it relates to that, that is a below market price, period. And again, I think an arbitrator would return the same, would return the same thing. Well, maybe we'll have an opportunity to see. So my next question, can I ask a... Yes, please. Is to a corporation council, can you explain so that I understand it? Um, the two years that we that if that if okay, so we're going to make a decision on this contract for the next five years. But can you explain that we are still uh, we are still bound by the contract with Arch for two more years? Can you explain that whole? Process. Uh, certainly, I'll try to. Um, the current uh, the current coal contract was extended some years ago, up and through December 31st, 2020. Mm -hmm. So there's five years left on the contract. Okay. In the contract, there's a provision that allows for what's called a price redetermination process. Uh, I think I've given everybody a copy of that mm -hmm. uh, paragraph out of the. Uh, contract uh, along with the whole contract at different times and in that process it allows either party to request on a basically a three-year uh, cycle but to request a, a price redetermination because the price is designed to float to track the market so that either party could request a price redetermination in this instance, the city formally requested a price redetermination July 1st of last year. Essentially, that was the first uh, opportunity the city had to request it. The, under the contract, there's a six, roughly six-month period through December 31st of 2015 to negotiate. Thereafter, it automatically turns to a, a non-binding arbitration process, which is to be completed by March 31st. In other words, January 1st to March 31st of this year, the parties at any time, like any court case, because an arbitration is kind of like a court case, at any time can settle or resolve uh, the uh, whatever issues through negotiation. And um, at the through that process of arbitration, the contract calls for the arbitrators to decide the essentially a fair market value for the coal for that three-year period. Now, in turn, if either party 
disagrees with that. That's why they call it non-binding. Either party can reject the arbitrator's decision. And the effect of that rejection would then be to allow a two-year, basically all, I would call it a cooling off period, <coughs> a two-year mandatory period in which notwithstanding the parties rejecting the arbitrator's decision, the arbitrator's price would apply during that two-year period. And at the end of that time, then the parties may proceed with business with, a, and I'm kind of giving a simplified mm -hmm. view here, but then could proceed to the city would be able to buy coal from whoever it wanted to, and Arch could, of course, sell to whoever you know they would choose to, because presently they are they are bound under this contract to provide us all our requirements, whatever that might be. So that process is there as part of a price redetermination. If the parties don't agree, it allows for arbitration, and the uh, city has, <clears throat> just or the parties, I should say, have actually only done the complete arbitration, I believe, one time. I think that was in 98. Uh, other times they've gone through, they've started or gone past the initial phase of the discussion where, quote, arbitration period, but they never actually did arbitration except one time, you know, during the entire history mm -hmm. of the contract. So does that uh, answer it your does. question? Okay. Okay. question. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I ask a question? Okay. Alderman Tylen. Um, I guess <coughs> that kind of was one of the directions I was going to go with my questioning was to uh, Mr. Zirkel with the explanation of the contract as it is that we are under contract the way I understand it is we have a five-year contract on our plate right now and that even if we did find a way to break the contract we're still under obligation for the next two years even if we did break the contract is that a fair summary well if the if we went to arbitration and this and the city rejected the arbitration price we would still be bound for a two-year period so my where I was going with this is that and I just like to say I understand both of you guys running your businesses you're fighting for your life and you're not sweating you're not acting like it you're not throwing a fit you're just presenting your facts your case the way things are going you guys are both being completely professional Forsyth this would be a jewel in their hat it'd be a nice addition to their business it'd be a nice additional profit to what they got going on completely understandable it's nice to be the girl that everybody wants to ask to dance but the problem is is that we have to take a look not only at the short term we have to look at the long term and we have to look at what legal situations we're placing ourselves and the city in by our votes and it's my opinion from discussions with everything we've heard and from reading the contract and looking at the presentations that if we were to look for a way to break the contract we would be subject to legal from ARCH. And it's also been stated by Mr. Dennison that he feels that in some way, some of the process that has been done, that we may, by staying with ARCH, be subject to some legal process from foresight. So we're, you know, it's catch-22. Either way, we're going to court. So I think the problem here is, is we need to have an understanding of what our legal representation feels is our best position as well as what is our best position for the utility and for our ratepayers. He brought up an excellent point about the, and I'm, I'm going to use the word hypothetical, predatory pricing, that if, in, if it is partially that direction, Let's just say that it's a, a non-intended consequence, but if Arch does lose this bid, as he said, there's a good chance that that's, there's not enough business to keep Viper Mine open. That removes the only other competing bid, competing bid when this contract is over and we go to the next one. It is a scary position to be in when you don't have multiple bids and you don't have something where you know where you're looking long term. There's a lot of times in business where people will come in with a lower price in the first year to try to lock something in long term because they feel that they'll make their money up over time. That said, I think the advice that we are receiving from Corporation Council agrees with the position that he has stated about the contract. And I think that this process has been very long. It's been very drawn out. 
and it's been very emotional for a lot of our constituents who are connected to this through employment or relatives that are employed. I've received a number of calls from people who are concerned. We're still going to do what's best for the city of Springfield, but I just wanted to kind of lay out my thought process and where I am after having listened today to our legal as well as the two presentations. I think it's fairly clear that no matter what we do, we're looking at a lawsuit. The question is whether or not we're going to be on the prevailing side of it. Alderman Donnell. Uh, my question has been answered. Thank you, okay. Chairman. Al Alderman Redpath. Yes, Mr. Ziegler, could, yes. you were talking about price, uh, predatory pricing. Can you, can you tell us what the term uh, <coughs> price monsieur, am I pronouncing that right, means? Price, price majeure? Yes. Um, what, what price majeure would mean in the context of the coal business would be, um, let's just say that you had a, a price of X. And uh, let's just say that as time goes by, coal prices go up to Y. Uh, a price majeure would be an event where somebody would <coughs> essentially not service the price X contract in favor of servicing the price Y contract. That, that's what that would mean in the context of the coal industry. Is that a declaration to court, or how does that work? Um, the, so there really would, let's just say that a price majeure in our business would not be, I, I wouldn't consider that to be ethical in any way. Um, instead, maybe what you're asking about is force majeure. So a force majeure provision would be one where either, uh, in the case of our contract, either the city, for some reason, uh, were no longer able to burn coal. Let's just say, there, God forbid, uh, there was something that happened at one of the coal units, and that unit was no longer able to burn coal because there was a mechanical failure. Uh, there would be a force majeure where they would not uh, be required to take those tons. That same force majeure provision applies to miners as well. If there were some a catastrophic event, God forbid, at anyone's mind where you were not able to provide coal, it would relieve you of that obligation. What this contract does provide for is in the event of a long-term force majeure, um, and I believe it's 180 days, uh, either party would have the right to either seek alternate supplies of coal or terminate the agreement. Okay. Thank you. Alderman McMahon. Just <coughs> Hopefully there will be no litigation. Hopefully the, the city's legal position will be strong enough to avoid any uh, legal fight here. And I think it would be counterproductive in the long term for parties to get involved in a legal dispute. I think that would be very highly counterproductive. But I also want to just make a comment that um, Foresight has been very helpful in all of this process. Um, providing a bid has been... Um, useful to the city and let's go back to the summer of uh, 2015 back then we didn't as a city council and as an administration we were unclear about two circumstances first we did not know how much of a price reduction we'd get from arch so therefore we've got to line up other possibilities if we did not get significant concessions from arch number two under the old bankruptcy law if there's a bankruptcy the, uh, under the old uh, the way it operated, the city could have terminated the contract with Arch immediately without any arbitration, without any two-year cooling down period, without anything. And so we had to be ready for that possibility. But subsequent, we, subsequently, we've learned that under the current bankruptcy laws, the bankruptcy of Arch does not permit the city of Springfield to immediately terminate the contract. And that's something um, uh, Alderman Hanauer has gotten in writing from our legal department from outside counsel. So those are two circumstances that we were not really fully aware of in 2015. So we properly invited Foresight to offer a bid uh, to prepare for two possible situations. And so we just wanted to get that out there. And uh, Foresight has been very helpful in this process by offering a bid. And uh, so I just wanted to get that out there. Thank you. Alderman Sino. Uh, first of all, I want to thank both of the companies for presenting us with the information. But uh, Corporation Council, can you explain exactly where the city is in the process? Again, just to refresh my memory so I can kind of get all this together, because it's been a lot for me to, to kind of encompass. So, Certainly. Um, the current contract lasts through December 31st of 2020. 
we are in the process of a price redetermination that we're, because of the timeline set out in the contract, um, we spent uh, uh, a substantial amount of time in negotiations. The contract mandatorily requires the party to proceed with arbitration absent settlement or absent resolution. And so effective January 1st, in effect, the parties could uh, proceed with arbitration. Uh, but in the interim, there has been an agreement or a conclusion of negotiations uh, that is now what is, uh, what is before the council. And, and to be clear, the city council in the ordinance is really making a choice of do you proceed with the uh, uh, contract as proposed, uh, as recommended, or does the city proceed with arbitration? Proceed with Those, what? With which contract are we speaking of? The one that's currently in place or the new one that you're... You I, I'm sorry, the, the contract as proposed, the price redetermination uh, provisions uh, that are in the contract uh, as referenced in the ordinance. So the choice is to, in effect, accept the renegotiated contract or to proceed with arbitration. So, so if we do that, then do we have to recognize the information that Forsyth has given us or do we just proceed with approving or disapproving the particular contract that you just stated? Well, the, uh, the choice before the, the city under the contract is to either uh, accept the uh, proposed uh, redetermined price, the, what's contained in the contract, or proceed with arbitration. Thank you very much. One thing that uh, I would like to point out uh, that for everybody that this is a reduction of a savings of a mi at minimum uh, around 60, 65 million dollars over a five year span. So I think that that's important for everybody to know. Um, what, I'm sorry. It's the, the reduction overall is, a, is right around, I don't have the exact numbers, but we know it's between 60, 65, maybe a little bit more. Is it five or three, though? Because we're not re realizing the first two, two years of the contract. No, that's, that's overall, that's overall right now, the minimum it would be. Over, for the next five years? For the next five years. Would be? The price of coal from $45 a ton, and roughly down to 35 right, and, and, and the other. And everything else. So, okay. so the... And that's city saves regardless. And that's using control. what? It wasn't from either. Us. Is that using arches or using using? That's forcing? right now. That's just at the minimum using if we used arch right now. Thank you. Is eight? I'm sorry. Is eight million? Are you okay? Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. See, he's he's always doing things to throw people off. <laughs> 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 just trying to, just distracting me, distracting, just That's being right. distracting. I'm, um, I'm just pointing out that overall, the minimum savings that would happen on this is is about <coughs> between 60 and 65 million overall, over five years. Using Archer's bid. That and that's the minimum, yes. Okay, using Archer's information for the new right. Year. But okay, that doesn't right. that that's way off kilter to what this. Um, you've you've. If you go from Let's 40, Let's hear from Doug. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get Doug in here, but. Yeah, because I'm, I'm looking at this that says, that has this 32 million figure, and then now you're saying it's 65, and that's. If you go from January, I mean from December of 2015, we're <coughs> with, with coal, with ash, with uh, the hauling prices that's gone down since the actual savings overall, uh, is is around approximately 60 65 million 69 million so you so, I'm, I'm i'm including the transportation that we dropped and, and everything else mm. so mr, mr. chair if i may say i think what the arch is million. saying is go ahead, go ahead john well, the, i'm sorry go, john arch is saying that uh by this price redetermination process we're going to save and what all the red path just said is we're going to save Roughly $69 million as compared to what we would have spent had the price of coal remained at $45 right. a and ton. Transportation now, transportation. Foresight is saying that they can save us even more monies they beyond that. 30. And that's where we get a lot of uh, differences I'm, of opinion. I believe uh, Director Brown is going to uh, get into that so yes, we can. Please. Is there any other questions for Mr. Ziegler? Thank you. 
Thank you. Appreciate your Thank time you. this evening. Thank you. Doug? Sorry to interrupt your presentation. Okay, so we're going to get into uh, really the, the, the crux of it, right? So we've got a little bit of a presentation here to go through. I'm going to have John to, Davis to help me a little bit. So, um, again, you know, so we want to look at the background and impact. Did you pass that out? What now? Did you pass that out? Yes. Does everybody have a copy? There it is. Like this. I think I got two. You want, you want this one? <laughs> <laughs> Should blame me for it. <laughs> Jim went over there and stole it before the meeting. That's because he just had a her. dog ear on. He would have won there with a little more crisp. <laughs> I could share it. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to also look at the options and offers, and then we're going to compare the offers. And then we're also going to talk about the Environmental Regulations Initiative Fund, which is a separate ordinance, and then just follow up with my over, the overall recommendation. So before we kind of get started, I want to kind of frame the main issues here. Uh, really what we're looking at is what is the best deal for the city in the long run? Okay, not just short term, but what's the best for the long run? And right now, for just the savings for the differences in price for coal and ash, okay, not including the hauling part, which what Alderman Hanauer is kind of getting to, just the savings of the coal price and the ash price is $57.9 million over the five year period. So, a part of this, what's the, you know, the best deal for the long run is we need a disposal of our ash now, okay? It's a guarantee that Arch can take our ash, they're permitted for it, and we've got a price for it. With foresight, it's not a guarantee. We want to ensure a fair competition in the future for the benefit of the city. So in the long run, that's, what, that's our goal. And then we also want to create a special fund for environmental compliance without increasing customer bills. So I'll turn it over to John to go over the background. I'm going to talk about uh, some background and some of the potential impacts of a coal switch. Uh, this first slide is pretty generic. I think we all realize that the contract's been in place since about 1980. And built in that contract is a reopener, except for every three years. Now, based on the, the previous reopener, that time frame has changed in the past. We've had price reopeners at three years, four years, and five years. So it is kind of a fluid number on how many years we go between price reopeners. Uh, we already talked about the 1998 arbitration, and actually in 2001, uh, we avoided arbitration while we were continuing negotiating in the contract. And as a side note, Arch purchased the mine from the International Coal Group, or ICG, in the summer of 2011. And we'll come back to that here in a couple of minutes on another slide. So, continuing with some background information here. Uh, so we've had numerous price reopeners pretty much with every owner in the past uh, a Viper or tourist coal mine was what it was originally called. The most recent reopener was actually in 2007 when uh, IGC owned, owned the mine and we went out for bids because we thought we were paying too much. Our, the RFP went out. The only company that submitted an RFP to us was Freeman Coal Company. Now, through that RFP process, we were able to renegotiate the price for a five-year redetermination window. So from 2007, we went to reopen the contract to 2012. In 2012, or actually the summer of 2011, prior to December 31st, 2012, Arch purchased the mine. So Arch was now owner of the Viper mine. We went out and looked at what we thought the fair market value was. All our information showed that we were actually paying less than what the fair market value was. I contacted Forsyth to see if they were interested in an RFP or put a bid in for us, and they were not. They said our price was already too low. They were selling their coal in the export market and had no desire to do business with us at that time. So Arch was considering doing a reopener. They decided not to do a reopener. So that's why there was no reopener in 2012. <coughs> we were already paying lower than what the fair market value was. So there, there was no value to us to go out there and try to get a lower price because it wasn't there. 
So this time around, um, we did go out for <coughs> see a year ago, we started to see where the coal price market was dropping. So we went out for an RFP, and this time Forsyth did respond, and they were the only ones that responded. So we used that price we got from Forsyth to help us determine fair market value and to go out there and negotiate a lower price with Arch. So these negotiations that we had with Arch were all private negotiations. Not, they weren't done in front of the council or in front of the public. They were done in private. Uh, you know, one actually thing that I want to point out between the, RF, the difference between an RFP and a seal competitive bid is when you open a seal competitive bid, the purchasing, purchasing agent reads everyone's price. In RFP, that doesn't happen. They open up the RFP and basically say, all right, this meets all the guidelines, it's accepted. So it's not, that's price is not put out for public review at that time. So, but we take that, that price that we get from the RFP and that's how we go about doing our <coughs> negotiations. In the current contract, the current coal contract that we have, fourth site is not a party to that contract. That's a contract between us and Arch at that time. So, continuing on some background information, uh, I think Mr. Ziegler did a very nice job talking about Arch's bankruptcy and where they stand today. But that, you know, he even mentioned that all coal companies are struggling. You know, they're no different than the five or six coal companies that have already filed for bankruptcy in the past, other than they're working their way through it right now. Foresight themselves, they have their own problems with uh, current financial difficulty. They have a $600 million dispute with shareholders. They just defaulted on $23 million bond payment. The dare run employees are suing them over a lack of uh, time frame of other layoff notices. And natural resource partners are in dispute with them over mine royalties. And that could amount to about $30 million a year. Now, all that aside, that just, that's just really to show that all coal companies are hurting. And Peabody, the largest producer in the world, is even saying that they may file for bankruptcy, as Arch is, has, or excuse me, as Foresight has said in the past. So all coal companies are hurting right now. Um, you know, f we talk about Viper, with two previous owners, has also gone through bankruptcy. And through both of those bankruptcies and the current bankruptcy, we have never seen a supply issue. They have never not delivered us coal during any of their bankruptcies. <coughs> so, impacts, uh, potential impacts of switching coal. We started to look at, you know, how, if we would switch coal, what would that do to us as a utility at the power plant? So we identified these uh, nine or so different projects or concerns that we have with, uh, with switching coal. The first one is, the first two kind of go hand in hand, reagent, silo, and coal handling controls upgrade. From previously burning similar coal at our lakeside plant, we know we need some type of fluxing agent in order to mix with the coal for the bottom ash, the bottom slide to flow. So we know we need to build a silo to house that reagent. Unfortunately, our current coal handling controls aren't robust enough to handle all, all the increased I.O. that would be required with, with that silo in that switch. So we have to upgrade our coal handling controls. On the boiler tuning and the modifications, we know there'll be extensive boiler tuning because of the fouling characteristics of the Forsyth coal. You know, we studied this, we've talked to the manufacturers of the boilers, so we know we have to tune that in order to avoid slagging up the, the convection pass over boilers. That may include, from a modification standpoint, the addition of soot blowers, in a place that we currently don't have soot blowers. And because of the grindability of the Forsyth coal, we may need to do mill upgrades. It's a softer coal, it's harder to grind. So we have to do changes there also. Ah. John, real quick, yes. are you talking about just in unit four, or are you talking in, in that, all the units? Or is that's there, all the units. Okay. Yes. Uh, is there a dollar figure uh, associated well, with all of these? All these come up about $5 million. Per year? No, it'd be a, well, some of them so have a one per year cost, cost, but for the most part, it's about a $5 million capital expense we'd have. So if their coal was going to be a $32 million savings, it'd only be a $27 million savings. You could say that, yes. That's part of what Doug will talk about here shortly. Okay. John, which ones are the, would be the ongoing costs? Well, uh, 
Merc removal modifications is one. Uh, we know because of the chlorine content of, of the Forsyth coal, <coughs> we won't have the oxidation of the mercury in our boilers like we normally do. So we have to have more, add more chemical. So we know every year we have about a $400,000 cost of additional chemical. $400,000? Uh, it's about that number, yes. So that, that's the uh, mercury removal. As far as emissions testing. And is that included in your $5 million number or is that on top? That is included in that number. So what, so could you like break it down? What is your fixed one-time cost versus ongoing cost? Uh, if you have all those numbers like that, Doug. The, did you pull all the costs out, for excluding the uh, the uh, ongoing costs? I didn't pull those out. I mean, it's like a $5 million cost just for that period of time. Because I think it would be helpful for Foresight, because they said they'd probably cover capital costs. Maybe they well, Doug will talk about that later, because that. Okay. we haven't really seen that from them yet. Okay, all right, cool. <clears throat> So, okay, just so I understand. Mm -hmm. So he's going to cover the costs that are one-time costs as opposed to those costs that would be ongoing over the five-year period. He has a, there's a capital uh, cost associated with switching coal, and we've put that into our calculations of $5 million. I'm going to cover all the costs to switch coal over a five-year period. And, and you'll be able to break that out, the ones that are... Ongoing as opposed to the ones that are. I can later, not in the presentation, but I can later. Okay. Would you please? Sure. Thanks. Okay. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Uh, from a, a FGDS wastewater treatment modification, we know what the ELG rules or their effluent limit guideline rules that changes will have to be made on our wastewater treatment, uh, our FGD wastewater treatment facility that we currently have. Until we had actually do the switch and analyze that, that stream. We don't know what those co costs would be or how much that would, would uh, impact us. From an SCR impact, our SCRs, you know, again, that's what removes our NOx from our boilers. SCR, give me a little more explanation on SCR, please. Uh, selective catalytic reduction is what it stands for. It is uh, of a process or it's the building that removes NOx from our flue gas. We, we actually got in contact with the manufacturer of our catalyst who designed and manufactured our catalyst and they analyzed the coal and they're telling us that because of some of the chemical characteristics of the coal we will see increased deactivation of our catalyst. And, and when you keep going through your uh, presentation if you could with an acronym if you could use the full description I'd appreciate that please. Okay. Thank you. I, I think this may be our, my last one here. So. Okay. Uh, but So our catalyst, a catalyst is what speeds up the transfer from NOx to nitrogen and water vapor. It's what it's allows it to, to take place. It's a big box and there's 40 of them on a layer, okay? And each of the, you know, it's about a million dollars to change out a layer of catalyst. They're very expensive. And what they've told us is that we'll have to change those, those layers of catalyst more often with this coal. So it's an increased cost that we'll have. And then, uh, back, kind of go back to the emissions testing. You know, emissions are a very regular part of our business these days. You know, in the past, you know, environmental regulations 20, 30 years ago weren't quite as strict as they are right now. So we only need to do extensive merc or emissions testing to make sure that we stay within all of our regulatory limits that we have. And based on that testing, we'll determine if we have any permit modifications that we may have to do uh, with the EPA. And finally, on the ash quality, <coughs> ash is really ash and gypsum quality, all of our current beneficial reuse contracts have certain qualities we have to maintain. And until we actually switch, we don't know if we have any issues with our current beneficial reuse contracts that we have. That would be a testing we'd done, we'd do, we'd do later. From a, uh, an overall standpoint, really what that does for us is it takes our plant manpower, it should be working on the environmental rules we have going forward, like the uh, ash pond work and put them on these type of jobs. So we're really distracting who, what we should be working on to do this work. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a, a question? Um, so with all the things that you've told us that you'd have to, so how did you, and how did you arrive at that? Did you test some of their coal? I mean, how did you get Well, we're going off the, uh, the analysis of their coal. Yeah, that's what I said. You did an analysis. Well, of they, they provided an they analysis provide, of okay. coal. And like I said, we sent some of that off to our our uh, 
catalyst manufacturer, mm -hmm. get their input. We talked to our chemical provider for mercury okay. just to see what they thought. They I just would. wanted to, I was just. So, and then like I said, you know, it, defer, it diverts our manpower from doing the things we should be doing in the future to try to make sure John, we can burn the school. Just to be clear, what you were, just to kind of clarify what I think I heard you say, is that you sent those specs off to our existing vendors. Correct. So it wasn't like it went to some lab or somebody else. It's our existing vendors that we're already in contracts with for our current power. They're the ones that, correct, they're the ones that designed and built our SCR, our, our catalyst, and the ones that spent, we you know we spent a couple of million dollars on mercury removal trying to find a chemical formulation that would work. All right, thank you. I'm going to turn over to Doug now. I just, I'll just say, you know, with, the, with the, that reagent, um, again, that's something that we we used this coal before when we had a separate power plant, the Lakeside Power Plant. It's now retired, um, so we were able to have us. We have experience with that reagent and what's needed to burn. So we use those previous costs, and that's what we'll be using uh, as we go forward here. Um, one of the impacts that is, that's kind of been discussed uh, already. Is that you know we are the majority uh, customer for Arch for Viper Mine, so if we leave them, the likelihood of it closing that's that's a real big concern for this community, for the city of Springfield. Uh, you know if there's no uh, Viper Mine, we have no competitive pricing then, so prices could easily rise to forty-five to fifty-five dollars a ton. Murray, who now is the really the the primary owner of Foresight, has stated publicly that they want to drive out competition so they can get prices back to $45 a ton. So you see that, that, has should, that should show everybody some very big concerns in the long run. Ash disposal prices could easily double or more. It's a loss to our con economy. Again, uh, you know, Arch has already covered this a little bit, but just to remind everyone that there is 51 employees that live in the city of Springfield, and I, I just, I asked them for some numbers of what those benefits were, and basically it's about five million dollars in, in salaries and benefits for those employees, and they spend about two and a half million for Springfield vendors to do business at their mine. It's lost the same in county as well. Again, you say why? You know, that's the county. This is the city. Why should we be concerned with that? Well, the city and the and the county do share in a partnership as far as sharing expenses and and and, and resources. And what affects the county really does affect the city. Now, if we can keep Viper Mine open, we're going to ensure, ensure, basically ensure fair competition in the future for this, the benefit of the city. So options, again, I, I think that's been discussed a little bit here, but I, I, there is a, a few items that we really need to, to, to vet out. Arches offer here, if we accept it, we're done, and we move on. Now, if... We reject Arch's offer. We do go to arbitration. I think we've made that pretty clear now. So with that, though, there's, there's really two options. Accept arbitration, and we, we keep that contract. We keep the price. We accept it. But we're going to have a price for opener in three years. The existing contract price adjusters will still be in effect because the contract that we've got on ordinance file right now is an amended contract. It removes these price adjusters. So without that, we go to arbitration. Those are still in there. So what those price adjusters are is for taxes, insurance, labor, capital costs. They're automatic adjusters that ARCH can apply to increase that, that price of coal. So the price that the arbitrator picks, those prices can still increase by those adjusters. And we've seen prices by 50 cents to $2 easily increase the price of that coal. We've seen at least one item in, in, or one time in, in a given year where that price increased by $7. Now the other option is to reject the arbitrator price and terminate the contract in two years and go with foresight. But again, we're stuck with that arbitrator price for years 16 and 17, and then foresight would be 18, 19, and, and 20. Again, the existing price contract price adjusters are still in effect. So for those two years, those prices can rise past what the arbitrator is going to pick. We're also concerned, again, and I think uh, 
uh, Arch alluded to this fact, is that the arbitrary price could be higher. Arch has stated to us that they can show pull commitments that are near or higher than $40 a ton. So that plays into our concerns as well. Getting into Foresight's offer, again, they did give us a long-term offer, so that's something that they put on the table. That's what we asked for because we wanted to see what our options were. And, you know, those, those first years are pretty attractive prices. The prices continue to rise in the outer years. And we don't feel that that's the same value there long term. We, we think that the market's going to remain more flat in the longer run. So we wanted to focus on a five-year contract, really, a five-year term. And that actually matches up with what Arch's contract is. And the, th the other thing that, that we have to remember, again, 2016 and 17, those prices we can't use. That's going to be set by an arbitrator. So when I start doing the comparison, I'm going to be looking at what we think could happen with an arbitrator setting that price in 16 and 17, and then what Arch's price is going to be shown to be eight in years 18 and 19 and 20. Again, we want to make sure it's equivalent, right? So we're going to make some adjustments here on based on the BTU of the, of the quality of the coal, because Foresight has a, a higher quality of coal for when it comes to the BTU. So their price is going to be lowered. Then we have to make an adjustment for the SO2. There's a difference between the mines and the quality of the SO2. Foresight has a higher SO2. Therefore, their price is increased. And then again, we, we have that reagent that we were talking about because we have the experience. We know how much per ton it takes to allow Foresight to burn our, our boilers. So we applied that, that cost adjuster to increase the price. And then again, the Hardgrove index, which Again, that gets to basically that there's a difference in the coal, so there's more wear and tear on our equipment to use Foresight's coal. Then we end up with the final adjusted prices at the bottom, and that's, those are the prices for years 2018, 19, and 20 that we'll use in my evaluation. Now, just one more concern here is Foresight's last earning reports uh, that was actually released last week. Uh, basically, their cast, uh, their, their Cash cost per ton sold was $28.30 per ton. And that excluded depreciation, depletion, and amortization. So it's, you know, technically it's not the, the, the total cost of, of their coal to produce. But if you look at uh, basically their first year, 2016, their price of $31.55 and you take out transportation, that's about $24 a ton compared to the $28.30. So they're actually giving us a price below their cost. I guess what that speaks to, the concern that we have with that, is just, is it sustainable over this period? Now getting to the, uh, some of the remaining components of Foresight's offer is the ash disposal. Again, they, they matched the offer for March. Um, it's a different, some different components, but it's still the same price overall. Um, with that though, Foresight right now is not approved by IDNR or the EPA to take our ash. So that, that's, that process, from our experience, will take months. It's not going to be something that's quick. We also doubt that they'll be able to get the permit. So what, we, what we do we risk with that by leaving ARCH, going with Foresight's <coughs> offer, not having a place to take our ash as soon as, basically, as if this ordinance is rejected, ASH has said that they'll stop taking our ASH. So we would be paying $35 a ton to landfill it. That's not including hauling costs. That's just the, 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 the tipping fee. So costs substantially increase for us in that case. Another risk, again, it's just not having a place to take our ASH immediately. Another risk for us is with the Shea mine itself, that the Illinois Times had an article that there's been over a thousand violations uh, for the Shea mine impoundment since 2009. So what does that hold for the future? Um, you know, we can't say what, what's going to happen. I'm sure they're aggressively trying to fix these issues, and, and they, they've probably fixed many of them. But we can evaluate companies based on past experience. So that concerns us if we get into a situation where they're taking our ash and they have violations and all of a sudden can't accept our ash. There's another risk and that we've done this before where we've tried to get beneficial reuse of our ash 
in a reclamation project with another company for a different mine, and based on our ash qualities, it was denied. So we've already seen this happen to where, you know, this is one of the four sites intended uses here. That's why we doubt that, that, that they'll actually get the permit. So the foresight offer, you know, again, you know, they, they've, they've stated here a couple times that they want a partnership with us to, to cover our cast for a cost switch. And ever since though the RFP and then more recently, we, we wanted to just get some really written confirmation that they're going to cover our costs. And they kept restating, restating that they want to sit down and for a long-term relationship and discuss some kind of an offer. It was a simple question. Can you cover our costs or not? It's a yes or no answer. We consider their, their response to be non-responsive at that point because those costs aren't, they're not committed to. Without a commitment, the city is carrying the risk. And five million is just a tipping point when you start really diving into the details of the environmental regulations and the possibilities that could exist. So should we carry all the risk for the switch to coal going from Arch to Foresight? No. <coughs> now for Arch's offer. Now we get a guaranteed fixed price, no adjustments for five years for coal and for ash. We can terminate the coal contract if Arch can't take our ash. Arbitration has been removed. So in five years, we're gonna be able to lock in a great deal moving forward because we don't have this period of two years where we have to wait and take the arbitrator's price and then finally accept the competitor's offer. We can jump right in. The coal price adjusters, again, that I've talked about have been removed. So there, there's some, these are really substantive changes here that, that we have, but we also have some housekeeping changes as well. So we did actually put a summary together and hand it out to you to kind of describe the contract and the changes that are taking place to make it a little bit easier to follow and where to look. Now, to compare them, there is, there's, there's a lot of things to look at here. So we got the coal price, the hauling, the ash price, the ash price, or the, the, the hauling, uh, the coal switching costs, so it's, you know, again, the cost to switch to different coals, and then we're trying to break it down then to an annual difference. I apologize for the public that this, this slide's pretty busy, but it's, there's a lot here to look at. Um, so we want to break it down. On the right side is Arches comparison. On the left side is Foresight's comparison. And we're going to first start out with coal. Again, Arches prices are $35.90 a ton. The coal price here for Foresight, the first two years, remember, that's set by an arbitrator. We don't know what that's going to be. We can run some scenarios and present you with some information of different possibilities, and, and that's all we can really do. So in 18, 19, and 20, though, we can use Foresight's prices, and that's what we've done. For the ash disposal, again, it's a fixed price for Arch, and Foresight agreed to match it. That's why those two balance out to the same. But if Arch can't get the permit, for our ash, we landfill it then at that point. You mean foresight? I'm sorry, yeah. That's, you're right, sorry about that. Don't confuse me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so if foresight can't get the permit for our ash, then we pay landfill costs. And that's $35 a ton. Again, that's, that's not hauling, that's just the tipping fee. The coal hauling, again, that's, that's included in foresight's price. And so we have to add that separately to arches. Once we break that down over a five-year period, we're going to get the difference in the prices. In this, in this scenario that we ran here, it's $8.1 million over a five-year period with an annual difference then of 1.6. Now, with the SO2 penalty, we have to add an, an, a, something back in to Foresight's favor because Arch has asked for a change in the modification to the SO2 penalty. And that, with their new price of $35.90, equates to about $500,000 a year. So we're trying to make sure it's up front and very fair of, of how we're applying the costs. So then we get to a cost of $2.1 million prior to adding our cost to switch. And again, our cost to switch is, about, is $5,010,000. <clears> so 
So divide that by five, and that's another million dollars off that price. So we end up with a total of $1.1 million. But again, going back to the arbitrator price of the $39 in this instance, that's just this scenario. Those price adjusters that I was talking about can affect that price after the arbitrator selected it. So those prices can increase 50 cents to $2 very easily. It could go higher. So that's something we have to be very cognizant of to, to make sure that we're not making the wrong decision. So with this, I ran some scenarios to get the different prices for the arbitrators picked in those first two years. And then also, in case we went with foresight for our ash or had to landfill our ash. But we're comparing that total cost then to Arch's complete offer. So in this call, first column, the, we have the arbitrator price of a $37 or a $38 or a $39. Then within those, we have two options really is, is for our ash. And that's again, that's the foresight or to the landfill. But we're still comparing it against Arch's offer. So as you can see then for $38 for an arbitrator price for foresight, if they take our ash and get the permit, it's $1.8 million difference annually. If we have to landfill it and, and pay that $35 fee per ton, it's in Arch's favor by 168000 So when you're looking at this, the red savings are with Foresight and the black savings are with Arch. <coughs> now remember again that these arbitrator prices can be adjusted up by those price adjustment factors that I talked about that are still in the contract. Would significantly change the outcome. Now for another topic here is basically the, the local bidder preference. So it's, it's something that the council has made it a priority to basically protect jobs in the city and in Sangamon County. Now it doesn't apply to, uh, to an RFP, but it does apply to sealed competitive bid and this is an RFP. But conceptually, I think it needs to be considered because it does show the impacts to the local economy and has been a cornerstone basically of city purchasing for, for, for many years now. So when you look at that, I've taken the same items that were the same dollars that were on the slide before without the county preference <coughs> and then <coughs> figured it with a 3% uh, charge basically against foresight to apply the Sangamon County difference because Arch has a physical presence in Sangamon County. So you can see that those all of a sudden shift more towards Arch's favor in each of those cases. And again, those price adjusters that are still in the contract that automatically allow Arch to increase for taxes, insurance, labor, capital, will drive all those prices along with the county preference, all under Arch's favor for every scenario. Now, something to consider I really is, is it worth maybe a possibility of a million dollar savings to two million dollar savings that may never be realized to where in the future we might be paying more for coal to where we might be losing five to ten million dollars a year because the prices are so high. Now to kind of get onto a different topic, the, 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 the second ordinance, okay? <laughs> uh, I apologize that they're this, the, the same presentation. Um, but we needed to create a fund for environmental regulations because they require future action. We have, a, we have to create an account that we can spend only on those initiatives. We want something that basically will help partially fund it because as I think I've stated before, that those costs for these projects are 20 to $60 million. <coughs> and without that, I mean, a future rate increase is guaranteed. We won't have a choice. So what we're trying to do is say, you know, let's start creating a fund with some money without increasing customer bills right now. One of them is the projects is modifying or closing the ash ponds, which we've talked about here for a few months and dry ash conversion of our units. Possibly we might have to build a, a, a biological treatment facility. <coughs> and we want to know how we can do that without increasing, increasing customer bill 
that's by creating this fund. We want to modify the fuel adjustment to include a charge that equals the savings for coal below the $39. Remember, rate restructuring basically gave some money back to the, to the, to the customers and also increased charges to balance the difference from 45 to 39. And, and, and right now, these coal savings pass directly to the customer without any action by the council. So the savings that I'm talking about pass directly back to the customer unless we make a change. And for these savings going to this account is estimated about 3.3 million a year. What that relates to though is how would we get that is that again, the fuel adjustment, the fuel savings pass back through the customer, but that same amount we're gonna apply a, a per kilowatt hour charge for each customer of $0.0019. So that equates to about $1.61 per month for an 850 kilowatt hour customer. Again, we're not increasing the bill, we're, we're we're letting the fuel adjustment drop down the customer's bill, but we're also increasing it by the same amount with a fixed charge. So what you're saying is, is that with the drop in coal price compared to what we passed on the budget, that would automatically pass through on the fuel charge rather than being something that you get to realize and bank. And yes. the only way that you'll be able to start building up your fund balance, which is something we've all been harping on you about, would be to do something to keep some of that money to put into the bank for the things that we've been talking about. Correct. Thank you. I got a, I got a quick All question. Sure. When, when we talked about the savings, uh, <coughs> we, we knew we knew we were going to put $39 in the budget, and that's what you did. Any savings in excess of the $39, which is what we're talking about here this evening, when we talked about the rate restructure, and when we talked about it at the budget hearing, I asked specifically, what are we going to do with that savings? And the answer that I got twice, not once, but twice, was that the utility planned on keeping some of that, those funds for capital projects like the ones you outlined. We're also going to provide rate relief to the ratepayers. And that's not what's being proposed here this evening? Well, specifically with the projects that we have outlined here for the ash ponds and basically the, some of these items that were basically implemented with the ELG rule, which came out in the, like the, about the middle to end of October. Right. Um, which was, unfortunately, that was after the rate restructuring. Um, those projects uh, weren't, and, I, and I, that was specifically asked if those projects were included in the rate restructuring, and, they, and I said that they were not. Um, so you're right as far as that's the, you know, you asked the question that would that savings pass back to the customer, and at that time, it, 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 it will. What I'm proposing is to change that plan because we do have these projects, whether we like it or not, we have to take care of these projects well, at I, some point. Now, we don't, we, we can, we can <coughs> hopefully say that maybe we'll make enough money to cover that costs in the future, but it's a risk. D Doug and, and, I, and Director, I appreciate you being upfront with us today about the potential costs and the unknowns that, I mean, it could be significant, millions of dollars. I do appreciate that, but we, you know, had that discussion not once but twice. I just wanted to point that out tonight. But what I'd like this council to consider is that if if uh, we're going to propose any kind of a change and the and the the relief not automatically going to the ratepayers, that those funds are kind of locked up, and then the the council's discretion that we would have the ability to utilize them for capital improvements or rate relief. But I'm telling you right now that rate relief is number one on my agenda. Rate relief to the customers of the city and the residents. And, and one of my next points was, you know, the spending from this account is geared only, well, again, that's only for these kinds of projects. And the, the, the approval process, everything has to be discussed by the council uh, through the budget process or when the contracts come up for award. So the council has the ultimate say in this. And my last bullet point is, and I feel passionate about here, because <coughs> the funds, if, if, let's just say that these projects change, requirements go away for some reason, they're not needed. Then that fund should be sent back to the customer. It's in a special account. We're not gonna spend it on anything else. So anything like that that would come back should go back to the customer. Right, but if, the, if what's being proposed tonight passes, the money is, in this fund and can only be utilized for the purposes as outlined in the ordinance. And one of those purposes is not uh, ratepayer relief. That's correct. As far as the way it stands now, yes. 
So I, I, I mean, I, I know we're going to discuss that ordinance here in a little while. But sure. I just absolutely appreciate the opportunity to say a few words. Question, <coughs> Alderman Senor. I see you use thirty nine dollars a ton, and all the other you were proposing a thirty five dollar. So why didn't you use it? Well, well, what I'm saying is it's the coal below the savings below. For, so really, from thirty nine dollars to thirty five nine, <coughs> the difference. That difference will be added to the fund. That's the difference that will be added to the fund. I guess, and that's eight hundred fifty thousand tons, because that's basically what the retail side of things are, not the wholesale. Well, side. Okay, well, what's happening to the money from forty-five fifty to thirty-nine? That is a part of the rate restructuring plan. So that's already allocated. That's already been allocated with that plan. So then, I, I, hold on a second. I guess my concern is, here's the thing: we we need to know farther in advance when things like this are coming up because I, I think that they know you you guys read the regulations and what's coming down and I feel like that that we're we're kept in the dark until the final regulations out and then we're stuck trying to trying to come up with money for for different um, different projects and I mean these regulations come out. I know EPA regulations come out two years in advance, and then everybody yells about them and screams, and then eventually it it's put in place. So you guys have to know the impact. I think that we we need to be notified. I, at least I feel like I haven't gotten notified, or I've gotten mixed signals. Ash Pond, the you know we still argue about that, but uh, I'm you know. Uh, we had the Burns and McDonald report that, that talked about it, and nobody seemed too concerned about it. Um, and it's, it, you know, these environmental issues. And I'm, I'm with Alderman Donnellan. We have got to give some rate um, uh, relief to the citizens of Springfield. And, and Director, uh, Alderman Turner had a point. You need to bring the proposal of what projects you want to lay out to us before we decide to put this in place. Alderman Don is absolutely right. We should be putting a certain percentage of this money back to the payers, and we need to have specific projects lined out before we can go forward with this. Well, and th these projects aren't guaranteed yet. Uh, I mean, we're still analyzing it, but it's, it's kind of a, a situation that we know there's going to be costs. And can we do something now without trying to impact the customer's bills? <coughs> In the future, or, I mean, if you let some of this pass back, or let all the pass back, that's your, your guys' decision. I don't Absolutely. think that's. Uh, I don't think we're arguing with you on that. Yeah. We agree yeah. that the, we have to come up to for a solution for the ash ponds sure. situation, but there's enough funds in here that we can pass back a rate uh, a rate reduction to the taxpayer to the rate payers. Mm -hmm. But uh, as Alderman Turner said, we need some specifics on what you're going to do. What what projects do you want to do this with? Well, again, just the three projects that I mentioned. Um, you know, the dry ash uh, conversions, the ash ponds, and the, the biological treatment facility range from 20 to $60 million. Even the minimum, you know, in over a five-year period, this is not going to touch it. Well, I'd like to see also what, what due dates are, are required from EPA on this so that we know what we got. And that's something we're still working on. You know, I think we're, 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 we're all going the same direct. We're all going for the same point, but we're going around the barn different directions here. Sure. So we need to slow this down a little bit. And just make sure we're all on track. Alderman Tyler. Um, my one thing that I would like to just throw out is a word of caution. Is that right now, what you're doing is you're calculating possible future savings here. We know there will be some, but we don't know exactly what the amount will be. We don't know how many tons of coal we're going to use. We, don't, we have ideas, mm -hmm. but we don't have the number. And this is a case of where I almost want to say, I'd like to, if we are going to give a rate payer relief, as well as setting some money aside for the rainy day projects, I would just like to throw out to the other aldermen to think about, I'd rather treat it kind of like a property tax, where we let it get Don't realized. Don't ever mention that again. And, no, 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 no. Bad analogy. Bad I would rather have the money get <laughs> saved up, and then at the end of the year, know what we have to give for rate relief, than project it and be off and put ourselves further under. I would rather realize the savings than give a break and then realize the savings again and calculate the next year and keep going forward that way. Alderman Turner? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Chair. Um, 
Thank you. Um, Thank you, Vice. I think in listening to the presentation and the, and the questions and the comments, I think that there are a large number of unknowns. I think that there are a lot of questions that aldermen have. I think there are a lot of things that we would like, a lot of more, more information we would like to see. So my suggestion would be to hold this in committee at least for two more weeks and, and ask um, CWLP to come back with some answers to those you questions. You talked about the last one, but yeah. not the coal, but the other one, right? I moved on from the coal. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, the, I'm trying to, trying to yeah, stay no, to no, your so getting late. No, I would, I would make a motion that we hold this in committee until we have some more definitive answers. Second. Yeah. All, any discussion on keeping? 2016 20, Yeah, the last not on. Which we're not yeah. on yet. We're right. not on that right now. Can we can we wait, hold that motion until we, sure. we get off That's the That's why I told you it was confusing to have all this stuff, <laughs> stuff there together. I'm, I'm with you, Alderman yeah, Turner. But, so when we get to that one, yes, okay, I would yeah. that motion. Okay. Okay. So let's okay. wrap up. Okay, if we can wrap it up. and Back to the main issues again, just to re recap every, this has been a long and trying time, right? So. No. Again, it's the, it's the best offer for the city that we're wanting to do, right? So we want to look at the best deal long term. Again, there's 57.9 million savings from ours right now, guaranteed with a prices reduction in their coal price and the ash price. Disposal of the ash is needed now. It's guaranteed with, with ARCH, not with Foresight, and it ensures fair competition in the future for the benefit of the city. So again, you know, the goal is trying to do something for environmental compliance without increasing customer bills, trying to generate some kind of a fund balance for those projects that, that's guaranteed for those. So recommendation is to accept ARCH's offer. It's less risk now and in five years. Any potential savings from Forsyth's price would be traded off if the Viper Mine were to close over the long term. Again, it's, it's, it's about what we might lose in five years if there's no competitive pricing. An arbitrator's price will determine the next two years, not the, not the Foresight's RFP. And remember, those price adjustment factors stay. So it'll increase those prices further. Again, you can adopt the fuel adjustment ordinance, help fund the environmental projects without increasing customer bills. It's just an option that we, we've laid out for you. I don't, think that, I don't think there's opposition. We just need to talk this out. So. Is there any other questions? Now that, that, that rounds out my presentation. Alderman Turner. I have a question. Not. I want to go back to the. We're going to coal. Sure. We're going we'll to let's. Coal coal why don't we hold our questions <laughs> on, uh, on, yeah, on only to coal? On how's, yes. how's that? We'll just hold it to the coal ordinance. Okay. The. Uh, uh, what is it? One thirty-two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Motion on the floor is what, Chair? Debate. The motion on the floor is for debate yeah. to move to debate. Mm -hmm for the next city council meeting. I'll call a question. No, I have a question. I'll call your question. <laughs> Alderman Turner. Okay, I'm just, again, I'm trying to understand all of this because we have to vote on this next week. And I don't two want weeks. to- Two weeks, two weeks. Yeah, we don't have weeks. a council don't meeting show next, up next week. Two weeks. Do I get extra credit if I show up next week? <laughs> Um, and I don't want to be here three hours next week, so I'm oh. trying to get all my questions <laughs> answered. So um, help me understand mm -hmm. if, and I'm going back to some other things that I heard mm -hmm. over the course of the night. So if we're, if, if, if Foresight's coal is burning hotter, which means there'll be less ash, right, and mm -hmm. we'll burn less of it, then how does that impact um, the pricing and, and but lowers their price, so they, their price is more attractive okay. when it comes to the BTU. Okay, and that's what I've shown on, the, on that on the spreadsheet with their numbers. Right, I've I lowered just... their price because of the BTU. Now the SO2 increases their price because they have a higher SO2 uh, number for mm -hmm. their for their call. Okay, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to understand. sure. No, I'm, that's, I'm okay. just making sure I want to explain that. that it's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alderman Redpath has got to call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the question is uh, the uh, move to debate agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Mr. Clerk, if you could figure out where we are.
We're at 216-152. Would you like me to read it again? Leave in committee. Yeah, I, I want to make a motion that we do you have to read it first? I'm sorry. I don't need to. We have a motion to to <laughs> leave this in committee. Second. Is there a second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, I believe the next door, is there, I lost my sheet. I think that's the last one, isn't it? We are on. Is there, there any um, old bit, any, any unfinished business? I do have one question, and this would be, I guess, for Mr. McCarty, since uh, <coughs> out here. Um, something came up in the last week about the uh, bidding instructions on the RFPs. It was something that uh, I didn't recall seeing before, and it came up in conversation about the instructions on the RFP stating that it basically limits conversations between the elected officials and anyone who puts in an RFP. Is that some language that's always been there, or is that something relatively new? Uh, I had some basic familiarity with that short conversation with the purchasing agent, and uh, he indicated that it's not always in there, but if I recall his words, and I'm trying to paraphrase here, he said that those RFPs are set up based on the, based on the requests and the specifications from the requesting department. Now, is that so? Is that something that is basically going to be put on RFP, RFPs at a individual notice, or is that something that's going to be on all RFPs going forward? I don't believe, unless requested, it will be on all RFPs going forward. Okay. Could I ask that if there is an RFP that's going out with that, that it, it kind of be when it's sent to all uh, council coordinator Griffin to give to us, that it kind of be mentioned that that is on the RFP. Um, Sometimes it gets kind of hard to go through all the uh, legalese and stuff that you guys put in these things. Sure. We Thank can you. certainly make sure that the council is aware. And, and I, w I would like a clarification on what conversation with elected officials would be. I mean, what kind of guidelines should we be following? Because I want to make sure that none of those are broken by any of us up here. Sure. We'll get you some information. Uh, and I think my, my concern is it's, it should either be all or none. Truthfully, I mean, because we don't know one way or the other. It should be all or not. It, it's either standard boilerplate or it isn't. And it shouldn't be up to the department, to, to the department director, whether they allow somebody to talk to us or not. That's just my opinion. I think that the, 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 in the case in point here is that it comes down to you have aldermen who are trying to do the best for their area that they're representing. And it makes it difficult sometimes if something like this is in place for them to find out the information that they want to know. Okay, is there any more un unfinished business? Any new business? Alderman Turner. Um, okay, so I know that um, election day was on Tuesday for the primary, and I was uh, hopeful that we could have changed that since there was five. Uh, Tuesdays in this month and I really was intending to be here and then as everybody knows there were a lot of issues and I couldn't make it so in November we had the same situation I know there are five Tuesdays in that month in that month as well and we usually take off the Tuesday of the week of Thanksgiving and I don't want to mess up anybody's Thanksgiving holiday so is and in the past I know we have scheduled council for that Wednesday so I'm making a plea that it is a large election. I don't think yeah. that's a, a bad request. You want to make a motion that we move it up Tuesday? I'll be out of the country that's that committee. Yes. Thanksgiving that's, week. It's a I think no, no, moving no. it from that Tuesday to that Wednesday and keeping it on the same week is completely reasonable. It's, okay. a, it's a committee night on that. Committee? Night. Yeah. Okay. Do we need to make a motion that we move it? What, so what, two, a motion to change the calendar to affect that yes. Tuesday in question to the fall, to the next to day. To the next on day Wednesday. on Wednesday. I do most of my cooking the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. No, no, no. This is <laughs> bring it in, John. We can help you with it. Oh, okay. Okay. The first yeah. week. You're not talking about the Wednesday. No. No. Ralph said he'll taste test for This will be November eighth. Will be changed to November 9th. Okay. Going from the eighth yes. to the ninth. And then, do we also need? Has the does the calendar reflect that we're off the Tuesday of Thanksgiving week, or do I need to make have that included in this motion. Why don't you just have it included, then it'll be covered. I'm asking a question. I'm sorry. That's all right. Man, she's been rowdy. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, could you take a look at the calendar real quick? Uh, that's what I'm doing right now. Okay. Thank you. 
See, I got the Mr. Right this time. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody would ever believe that I'm doing something in November right now. I'm always Is it looking. basketball again? I'm the last minute. See. Oh. <laughs> I'm always the last minute person, so I'm very proud of myself. It's the third Tuesday. Third Tuesday? Yeah. All right. So that's the opening? So we're, we're scheduled to be here the week of Thanksgiving then? I don't have that information. Okay, well, we can let it go. Yeah, Alderman yeah, Turner, do you want to get with with uh, uh, the clerk and we'll, we'll we can bring this up and we can okay. adjust it? Okay, that's well, great. Then. Thank you. Okay. Actually, uh, your motion off. is still to move from the 8th to the 9th. You're off the 22nd of November. That's what we need to be. Guys. Okay, be, that's, that's fine. Don't okay. mess up deer hunting. So we have a motion. Do we need to vote on that calendar change, Mr. Zirkle? Yes. Any, any, any other discussion on the move? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Don't leave Mark. Don't leave Mark. I have it. Um, any other new business? Any citizens to request uh, to address the committee, uh, Mr. Lesko? Did we've done? We, we have to adjourn. I have an executive session. And then we have an. Oh, we've had a request for an executive session to go over pending, pending litigation. So uh, at this time, I'll take her take a motion so to resign. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hopefully this won't take longer. Do we have a motion to reconvene? Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yeah, discuss Aye. this. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. I think I might have set the record for the longest meeting. Too. No, we've been here till 10 o'clock before. Hey, when Ozzy was here, we stayed at 1 o'clock.